Um, I'd like to thank uh, Pia for bringing me to Denmark. This is, has turned out to be like one of the highlight lectures. I've lectured all over the place, but this is an absolutely beautiful city and a, a fantastic venue, and I'm kind of surprised that in a magnificent city like this, people don't have something better to do than to come and sit and watch me. But I appreciate everybody showing up. And the lecture I'm going to give today is a little bit of um, two different parts. I've been at this for 43 years, and um, I keep getting dragged into the disclosure thing, which I'm going to talk about. The U.S. government leaking material as to what's going on, what the, what's actually happening. And it's a, a story that I try to get out of. I, try to, I continue to try to shut down and go to what I'm going to talk about at the end, the experience or truth. That to me, and I say absolutely, that unless you look at the people who are interacting with this phenomena, and there are a number of people who actually claim they're interacting with the intelligence behind the phenomena, and I say unless you go to that thing and you go to the field of consciousness, you will never, ever figure out what's going on. So I'm going to do the first part of the lecture on what the government is up to in the United States. And because I did the U.S. presidents for a number of years, for maybe 25 years, I do a lot of lecturing in the United States. I'm from Canada, but I'm sort of the guy who does the U.S. presidents. And so I'm pretty well known in the United States. And so let's get started. And the first part is the disclosure circus. And to me, it is a circus. It is, um, in a lot of ways, sort of a waste of time, but it is, it is what people are very interested in. And as I said, I'm from Canada. I live maybe 100 kilometers from the U.S. border. And when the dollar was a little bit better, we, our dollar is very weak compared to the Americans. We used, people used to go across all the time. And now, because of the political situation in the United States, a lot of Canadians basically will not go in the United States. Uh, they sort of are boycotting. But... We actually have, I live in a place called Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. It's the coldest major city in the world. And there's a very important UFO event that took place there in 1967. And the Canadian government has actually made a $20 co uh, coin for that event. It was a Stephen Mikulak case in 1967, about 90 miles from where I live, right next to the American border. Uh, this UFO landed. Uh, this guy was prospecting. And he was, had his, all his tools. He was walking around in this bush area. This thing came down. The door was open. He looked in the door. He was yelling. To, he thought it was Americans. Come on out. You got Americans. Come on. Come on out. And, and nobody answered. And then he was, he was Polish, so he spoke Russian, Polish. He went through all these different languages. He got no response. And then suddenly the door shut on the craft. It started to spin around as it was taking off. And there was a vent on the side with uh, grates. And the vent came across, his shirt started on fire. He had uh, sort of very serious radiation burns. Uh, this went on for many years. It was investigated by the US Air Force. And it became a very, very famous case. And the Canadian government has actually uh, made a coin for this, although it is sold out, so you can't buy it. Uh, this, is, um, this is Canada. The other thing that we always say is that because we live in this area, most of the Americans will come up and fish. So I always like to show this little slide. Americans coming up, they come to fish because our fish are fairly big and we have 100,000 lakes where I live. And so Americans always come up there to fish. So I'll show you here an example of Americans up here fishing in Canada. And that, that might show you why Donald Trump is going to Great Britain for a visit, but he's probably not going to come to Canada. We'll get him to go fishing. This is the object I saw in 1975. I didn't want to see most of my career, my UFO career, I didn't intend any of it. I didn't intend to see a UFO. I had a download experience in 2012. I didn't intend to have that. I've had a couple of messages I'm going to talk about from aliens. I didn't intend that. Uh, my career has just been dragged. I've been dragged down one rabbit hole after another. Didn't intend any of it. So this, this event happened in 1975. Just to give you a background, um, I was into Edgar Cayce. I was into uh, the study of near-death experiences, into death. I've been fascinated with the, the, the idea of death. I wasn't interested in UFOs. There was a small town just outside my city where the object was seen almost every night. And it was called Charlie Red Star. This is the object. This is one of the best photographs that was taken of it. I said to my friends, let's go out and see what's going on. 
I, he said, okay, we were very young. I was at university at the time. We didn't go, and then three months later, they caught this thing jumping off the ground on film. The local TV station caught it on the ground, and it jumped up in the air, and they filmed this whole thing as it took place. And it was at that point I said to my friend, come on, let's go see. And I describe it as the lottery ticket. You buy a lottery ticket, and you know there's a chance you're going to win, but you know you're not going to win. And that's what it was. I thought, everybody else will see it. We won't see it. We went out, we were in the town, in the town, out of the town, in the town, out of the town. An hour later, my friend said to me, who was driving, said, we'll go back in the town one more time, and if we don't see anything, let's go home. I said, fantastic, this has been a total waste of time. We drove, just turned around the car to go back in, and the thing flew right in front of the car, and it was not a light in the sky. It was an object, it was down low, it was very low to the ground, very, very close in front of the car, almost like they wanted me, and we were, looking around at stuff, was this what they're looking at, is this what they're looking at? When that thing appeared, nobody said, is that what they're looking at? Everybody just went, there it is. Everybody just instinctively knew this is the object that everybody had been talking about. I fell off the edge of the earth. The rest of the people in the car went on with their life. I went out two nights later, dragged all my friends out there. After an hour, they all said, we're going home. We're hungry, we're going home. I said, no, no, stay. You gotta see this, you gotta see this. We're going home. They went home 15 minutes later, it appeared a second time. This time it flew right at us a second time. And it was at that point when the thing made the turn, it was coming right at us and down very low, it was red, it looked like it was alive, it was sort of beating, it was coming right at us. Little green glow on the backside and it made a turn and it headed off into the north. And I remember thinking, wow, that may be actually from another planet. I was just uh, absorbed, and I couldn't figure out why nobody was investigating it. So I went and investigated the whole thing. I interviewed hundreds of witnesses in this small town. Half the town had seen this thing. And I would interview all these people, and I put together a manuscript, which I tried to publish, and has now been published in the last couple of months out of a, a publishing company in Toronto. It's called Tales of Charlie Red Star. And nobody would publish the manuscript. And the local publisher, because it was a very famous story in Manitoba, where I come from, the local publisher set the course for my life. When I sent her the manuscript, she replied to me, she said, Mr. Cameron, you may believe in this kind of stuff, count me among the unbelievers. And I went, whoa, I just couldn't believe it. I, like, I thought this was the greatest story in the world, I had all these witnesses and stuff, and she just said, I don't care. So I gave up on witnesses, and this object, which I saw first in May of 1975, all I was interested in at that point was who knows what I saw? I'm just an ordinary person. There must be somebody in the world that knows what's going on. So I started a, a, a crusade to find the highest level people that I could. Somebody who would know, had, had the security clearance, the power, the political power, whatever it was, that would know what's going on. I went to the Canadian government. I studied what the Canadian government had done. I put a lot of that stuff on my website, which is presidentialufo.com. And that led me to the former president of Penn State University, who had 14 honorary doctorate degrees, was chairman of the board of the Institute for Defense Analysis, and I'll talk about him in a little bit later on. And his research, chasing him for eight years, trying to get him to tell us, because he knew what was going on. And he was very, very old at the time. And I went to the pre one of the presidential libraries where he said he was going to send some of his material to look at his files. And it was there that I got the idea oh, the president is the most important person in the world. What does he know about UFOs? And I started going from presidential library to presidential library to find out which presidents had had sightings, what they had written about it, what the documents were. And the last thing that I worked on was I started chasing the head people at the CIA. And I figured that they knew, and some of these people were actually talking, sort of in rhymes and riddles, and it appeared that they were leaking material. So I started to chase them. So that's been my whole career is to chase that. And then as I'm gonna show you at the end, in 2012, I have a download experience where I say, almost like the publisher, this is a waste of time. And it's like, whoa, and, and I suddenly, I could see what was going on and I moved into this field of consciousness. And at the end, I'll show you the, what I consider the most important story I've seen in 45 years, which happened to me last year. So. This is the latest book, and Pia has actually helped me with this book. Her name, in, if you get it off Amazon, her name is actually in the book now. She uh, pre presented a lot of this stuff. She was helping me. And what this book is, is a book on music. I got a, a message from an alien. 
And the alien is this one here. You can see it in the crop circle in 2002 in Great Britain. And up in the top right-hand corner is the actual alien. Uh, they're called the guardians. And it's the aliens that were interacting with uh, uh, an experiencer by the name of Chris Bledsoe, who's in North Carolina. He's a guy who Warner Brothers, the Hollywood production company, was going to spend $80 million. They said this story would be bigger than The Passion of the Christ, which was a huge, huge movie in the United States. And he had this encounter in 2007 with these beings. They're, ten, they're, they're seven feet tall, they're bluish green, and he calls them the guardians. And you'll see that in 2002, they appear in this crop circle. It's exactly the same alien. There's no doubt it's the same alien. So anyway, he phoned me in 2014. I have to have this download experience, which we'll talk about later. And he said, Grant, he said, I got a message for you from the Guardians. And I said, okay, because I'd had some bizarre experience with this guy. And I knew this guy was, he's in touch with something. I don't know what's going on, but he's very much, a lot of stuff happening around this guy. So he said, I've got a message from the Guardians. I said, okay, what is it? And he said, they want you to know that the message is in the music. And it was at that point I said, well, Chris, you may be talking to the wrong guy because I'm not into music. I don't play music. My whole family is very musical. I've never played an instrument, nor do I ever intend to play an instrument. I don't listen to music. I've never listened to music. And I, so I said, well, you know, and he said, well, you should listen to the song Cashmere by Led Zeppelin. And I went, okay, whatever. And then he said, the other song you should listen to, and this is how you, I kept getting dragged down into these rabbit holes. I was not gonna touch this story. I had no interest in the story. Then he said, you should also listen to a song called After the Gold Rush by Neil Young. And I went, Neil Young? Is you, are you kidding me, Neil Young? And I live, as I said, I live in a city that people in, even in Canada don't wanna go to. And Neil Young grew up there. And we've had some famous musicians come out of this. I live in a city of about 700,000 people. So Neil Young came out of this city and I would not have touched the story if it hadn't been for Neil Young. So I said, Neil Young is involved? And he said, yeah. And so when I looked at the lyrics, and if you look at the lyrics in After the Gold Rush, it basically is the, the message that a lot of experiencers put out. 39% of all experiencers say when they're on board the ship, they are shown the screen, what's called the screen. And on the screen, there's these environmental images of the destruction of the world, that we're destroying the world. And this is the lyrics that are at the end of the Neil, Neil Young song, After the Gold Rush. And so it basically says, we're treating the world like a, like a gold rush. And when the gold is gone, the silver seeds, the flying saucers, are going to come down and they're going to take the chosen ones, which is what often is described as the, the experiencers, the people who have been abducted. They're going to take the chosen ones to another planet. So I was hooked, and then I started putting this thing together, and I will do an online thing uh, which will describe this, this book. This is some of the most fascinating stuff. I mean, if you think disclosure is exciting, you should see we go through a lot of very, very interesting download experiences, and even we were at the Bohr Institute. And I will talk about that a little bit, um, where the idea of the quantum atom came from. It didn't come from somebody figuring it out. It came from a download where Bohr was, was in a dream and he's at a horse race and they're describing how the, uh, how the electrons stay in, in orbits. They're like horse, horse track race, racing. And then the behind the park, we were in behind the park and, and Werner Heisenberg, the quantum uh, idea of the uncertainty principle behind the park, that came in a download as well. So what this book is, or this book on music is all the musicians who have gotten songs in dreams, all the ones who have spontaneously written songs, all the ones who are interested in UFOs. And I claim, I sort of indicate that there may be as many as three dozen major musicians that I believe are experiencers who have interacted with the beings and how many have written UFO songs. And it's just an amazing, amazing story. And again, it came from somebody phoning me up and saying, I got a message from an alien. And I've now gotten three messages from aliens. And every time someone phones up and gives me a message, now I listen very carefully and all I say is, make sure you get the message. What's the message? Because it's a bizarre world where almost nothing is impossible. This is the, the, the book that we're gonna talk about a bit like today. It's called Managing Magic, The Government's UFO Disclosure Plan. And I've been in this for about 20 years. And what I say in the book is that the US government has been leaking since 1947 what's going on. They don't want you to be able to confirm it, but they are leaking certain aspects of the story. They're indirectly through fiction, through Hollywood, through various methods, they are leaking the story of what is going on. And what they do is they, 
surround it by disinformation so that it gets out there and nobody can confirm it. So the story bounces around, everybody hears the story about the live alien at Area 51, crafts at Area 51, uh, you know, the fact that there's a committee that's running the thing, all these different things are leaked out, but nobody can confirm it. So I wrote this book, and now I'm working on a second book to, because as you probably know, there's been some recent developments, a bunch of stuff has happened, and then I swear I'm getting out of this thing, I'm going back to the consciousness and, and that kind of stuff. But um, I say, um, and I've worked on this for many, many years, I started the disclosure thing back in the 1980s, working with a guy by the name of Bill Moore, who was considered to be the top UFO researcher in the world at the time. And he had interacted inside the, the American government, had a bunch of contacts, a bunch of sources. So what I say, and I think people sort of get this confused, what I say is the government is not disclosing. What they're doing is more like confirmation, which I'll talk about later. If they wanted to disclose what was going on, they'd put the President of the United States on a news conference, and they would show the bodies and the crafts, and they would tell you what's going on. So no matter what anybody says, they are not disclosing. And they are, no, they are also not covering up. A lot of people will say the government is covering up, but they're not covering up. Because if they wanted to cover up, they'd do what Denmark does, what Canada does, what Australia does, what Germany does, what every other country in the world does, is just shut up and quit talking about it. The phenomena of leaked documents, the phenomena of people, uh, whistleblowers, is an American phenomenon. It does not happen anywhere else in the world. You hear all these stories about uh, documents being released in different countries. Basically, the only thing these countries have been releasing is the citing reports and the correspondence to the, the government. The top secret, the secret documents are not talked about in other countries. So this is an American phenomena. So the government isn't disclosing, they're not covering up, they're doing something in between. And that's what I've been working on. And the more I see it, the more I'm absolutely convinced they are working in this sort of middle road where they're sort of dripping, it's called drip, drip disclosure. I've, the, the, uh, the, the, the recent developments surround a guy by the name of Tom DeLong. And Tom DeLong has actually come after me in the last couple of weeks. So now I'm really dragged into this thing. I really can't get out of it because he's basically saying that I'm not inside TSSA. I've got people, my, my rule is that if I'm watching you, I don't, I've always have, I'm always one step removed from my victim. I never talk directly to anybody. I talk to somebody who's talking to that person. So he's right. I don't have any direct contacts in TSSA, although I've talked to people who are associated with TSSA. And he said that I'm, I'm, I'm getting things wrong. And so, yeah. What is TTSA? Uh, that's To The Stars Academy. So Tom DeLong is a, a musician. He sold 30 million albums. He's a very, very powerful musician in, in the United States. Got into UFOs. He's very interested in UFOs. And he set up this organization called To The Stars Academy, T TTSA. And he has a bunch of people. But what, what they've done is they've just created a second level of secrecy. So before you had the government with the secrecy and they're building weapons with, with what they're developing, and then you have this second level. So the government starts to tell Tom DeLong and this organization, TTSA, things that are happening, and now they're covering it up. And they're, 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 they're gonna make it for business. So they're selling books, they're gonna do documentaries. Tom DeLong has six books that are coming out. And so if you read all six books over the next couple of years, you'll know what's going on. But you gotta buy the six books in order to find out what's going on. So they're doing the same thing. They're, they're trying to make money out of, this, out of this, um, this thing. But they are, I believe all these people are honestly trying to uh, get some stuff out. So he came after me. So basically what I say in response to this is, if all the people who are covering up go to me and I get them under oath and they, I get to ask them questions and they have to tell the truth, and if I get all the documents, I'll correct all the mistakes. But until I have all the people speaking publicly under oath without security clearances and without the documents, yes, at some times I will be guessing and sometimes I'm going to get it wrong. And when they give me the correct material, I will correct all the mistakes. I self-publish so I can change my manuscript every single day. If I find something is wrong, I will change it in the manuscript that day. I'm not, I'm very open about getting the, the, the truth. One of the things that they came up with, and we've, we've caught them on this, um, they say that we're making mistakes. This is, if you've ever seen the To The Stars Academy news conference that occurred in uh, October of last year, when they announced this whole program, 
that they were going to disclose videos and all this kind of stuff to the American people, they, pres they showed this photograph in the background. And it's a photograph that they sort of implied was a UFO. It's not a UFO. I discovered it independently. Steve, Steve Mira in the, in the UK discovered it independently. And this is actually believed to be a balloon from 2005 in, in England. So we went to them and said, you've got, this is not a UFO, and you're using this photograph. And it actually took them three months to confirm to Steve Mira that they, yeah, they had, they're going to correct it. They made a mistake. But we've caught them on that. And now we have this latest development. There's a program called AATIP, A-A-T-I-P, it's the Advanced Aerospace or Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, and this is the discovery that I'll talk about, that the New York Times puts out an article last December. It's the first time the New York Times has ever had a UFO story on the front page of the newspaper. And when the New York Times does a story, suddenly it's open season. Anybody can do the story. If the New York Times does it, it's okay. So they do this clear story and they basically talk about this ATIP program, which is a program that was started in 2007 to investigate UFOs by the Defense Department. So they put this out, Tom, Tom DeLong's people put this out. And then in, just in the last couple of days, we've discovered that it's actually not really the name that you need because we were not able to get anything through FOIA and now the, the name has actually changed. So now we're gonna have, we're going after, I've actually posted to Tom DeLong. okay, if you want to tell the truth, then explain what's going on here. You were using the wrong term. Why, why didn't you use the right term, which apparently is this other one that has weapons in the, in the, um, in the title. And that scares a lot of experiences. It scares a lot of people in the UFO community that this may be turned into weapons, that all the research that's being done by the US government is gonna be used to build weapons to, bomb countries or, or do whatever. So the, this is the, the latest development where I'll talk a little bit about this, but we've caught them in mistakes. And it's this secrecy thing, they won't talk to anybody. And so we have to talk to people who are talking to them and we're doing the best job we can to figure out what's going on. But I can guarantee you, there is some sort of disclosure initiative going on or some sort of confirmation stuff going on. This is, there's actually two sort of um, programs. There's this, program that Tom DeLong is describing. Then there's a second program, which I've been watching again for 20 years. This is um, a guy, his name is Dan Smith. He lives on the East Coast of the United States and he's very good friends with Dr. Ron Pandolfi. Ron Pandolfi is rumored to be the guy at the CIA who runs the UFO program. He's the guy. He's the guy that briefs the president. He's the guy that has what they call the keys. So when you have a classified program, you're gonna have somebody who knows where all the classified material, all the briefings. And Ron Pandolfi, we know for a fact that in 1993, when Lawrence Rockefeller went to the Clinton White House to get disclosure, uh, they were, he was interacting with the science advisor to the president. And the science advisor needed to know what was going on because he said, we're gonna have, what's going on with UFOs? Are we doing UFOs? They put out a request and it was Ron Pandolfi who got the job to provide the briefing to the science advisor to the president. So Ron is a very, very powerful guy. And I believe there's a second sort of disclosure. They keep telling me that they are going to be the people who are going to disclose. And theirs has got to do sort of with a, a concept of portals. And I'll get to this at the end. This is the idea that the, the beings are not coming through crafts. They're coming through wormholes. They're coming through dimensional gateways. They're coming through what, what, what they call these, these portal things. So this is only a couple, and I'll show you how fast the story is developing. This only happened about three weeks ago. I was in the United States lecturing and I got a phone call from Dan Smith and he said, I need to talk to you, why don't you answer your phone? And when you're in a foreign country, your phone's on roaming, so you don't really use your phone. I managed to get a hold of him and he said, there's been a development and they told this story of a, uh, what he believed was this portal technology that's being worked on by a guy named Joe Firmage, who lives in Salt Lake City. He had a, uh, a two and a half billion dollar computer company that he was this, the executive officer of. He had a vision in his room. This being came into his room. They were talking about uh, outer space. And the being said to Joe Firmage, why should we help you? And Jer Joe Firmage said, because I'm willing to die for it. And after that experience, Joe Firmage basically quits his job. And he goes into trying to develop portal technology, trying to develop this interdimensional portal technology. And this is the story that they were putting out, that they had actually had an event at Salt Lake City. They had this uh, instrument going 
and that this portal had opened up and a blue being had come through the portal and they caught this all on film and they had interacted with the person, his name is Kevin Alber, who was at the site at the time and a telepathic message came and the alien basically said, can we help you? And so I knew this film had been taken. I went to Dan Smith and I didn't even ask him whether they're going to release the film because I knew they wouldn't release the film because it's, it's all a game. So I said, okay, the film, why are you not releasing the film? And he said, well, it's just another film. Uh, you know, it really doesn't prove anything, whatever. And I said, so I was left to say, did Ron see it? Did Ron Pandolfi see it? Yes, he saw it. I said, did he consider the film to be significant? And he said, yes, he did. So this is the second one. And I don't watch it very much because not much happens. They, there is this thing behind there. They offered me an insight on this thing. They offered me to be a part of this disclosure initiative. I said, I will help you, whatever you want answer your questions, whatever. If you need any help, I don't really want to be a part of it. I don't really want to, I would rather be a chess player than a chess piece. So I was told you can be on the inside, you're going to have 100% of knowing exactly what we're going to do. You're going to see the phone calls, you're going to be involved, or you'll be on the outside, you get 10 to 15%. I said, I'll take the 10 to 15%. So I'm working on this one, but it's not as, it's not as productive. It hasn't produced as much as the, the, the long thing. So there's actually two initiatives going on. One by this CIA guy, one by Tom DeLong, this musician who sold 30 million albums. Every time he tweets, he gets 15,000 retweets. He's a big, big figure in the United States. So the way I set up the book is I say, it's magic. What I, what I maintain, I may be wrong, is that it's not just UFOs. If you look at what the CIA says, they, it, the word is used is phenomenology. So it's not just UFOs, it's remote viewing, it's ghosts, it's tele telepathy, it's all the, these bizarre phenomena. It's all the same thing, called phenomenology. And UFOs is only one part of it. So what I say, they're not dealing with UFOs, they're dealing with magic. They're dealing with all these different paranormal phenomena, and they're all linked, they're all connected. And so what I say is, you have magicians who understand some of the magic, all this paranormal stuff. And what they do is they feed it to messiahs, people who, like Tom DeLonge, Stephen Greer, this Dan Smith that I showed you before, believe that it is their role in life to get the material out. So the magicians are feeding the material to these messiahs. So I wrote this book, but what I say is the Tom DeLonge operation that's going on now, this disclosure, this dripping ideas of what's going on now has been going on for 70 years. And what I do in Managing Magic is I go year by year by year, and you go, oh, another one, another one. 56, Walt Disney is offered a documentary. 1973, my friend Bob Emminger is offered a documentary. And these, they're giving these people material to put into documentaries to get the word out. They don't want you back in 1947 where you have no idea what's going on because if there's a crash, if something happens, they want the people to be as up to date as to what's going on without being able to confirm it so you don't have all sorts of bad things happen. I will skip the next part. This is, this is when, when it rains, it pours. And what has happened is now, because I'm working on this, when I'm trying to get out of it, I have received this, which is a, a, an eyes-only study. People will say to me, does the president know? And I always say, absolutely, the president knows what's going on. They want you to think the president doesn't know what's going on because they don't want you asking questions of the president. So they play this plausible deniability, the president doesn't know what's going on. This is a study that, that I got, somebody gave me 100 pages of documents from this study. This is an eyes only study for President uh, tr uh, Johnson in the late 1960s. And in this study, it basically shows a committee of eight people who are working on uh, a program to discover UFOs and to give it to the president. So I've got this, and just to quickly show you, um, it's the same, same group. You have CIA, you have the, the To The Stars Academy, then you have the Eyes Only Study in the 1960s, and you have the same thing. You have the head guy from the CIA, head guy from Lockheed Skunk Works, a top guy from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, you have a, a top physicist, and then you have a guy at the National Reconnaissance Organization, which is the, the group that uh, takes all the U.S. satellites, all the spy satellites, all that kind of stuff, is the National Reconnaissance. And he, both these studies, whether it's the To The Stars or where the Johnson thing, they have the same people on, uh, that, are, that are doing the study, almost as if you need these people in order to, to work on the UFO program. The TSS organization, I said, it was started by Tom DeLong um, in about 2015. Uh, he has always been interested in UFOs, and he makes a move to the US government. 
He believes that he has a way to get the story out. And he was with Blink-182, the, the rock band, and has a, lot, a big following among very young people in the United States. So he goes to, the, um, uh, um, to Lockheed Skunk Works. He puts out the message that you guys are messing this thing up. You're trying to get the story out to the American people. You don't know what you're doing. You need someone to help you. And I have this big following among young people. And if you want to get the message to them, I've got this plan to do it. So that's where the origin, this is where TSSA comes. So Tom DeLong builds this operation. He builds this platform, which, which the government can work through this platform. But what I always want to correct to people is that the, there's actually, in, in the thing, it's not Tom, people think that Tom DeLong set it up. And what I say is Tom DeLong did not set it up. He set up the platform. They came in and they gave him all the people that are talking to him. He didn't find these people. And that's the important thing. Is Tom DeLong running this thing or is, are they running Tom DeLong? And Tom DeLong in that message that you saw at the beginning actually says, I'm not running this thing. And I said in my reply, I've known this for a long time, you're not running it. He just provided the platform. So there's a bunch of conservative elements. And, and if you've seen the stories, the New York Times does the story in December. They say the government has been investigating UFOs. They've been doing it since 2007. The Washington Post does a story and says, not only has the Defense Department been doing it, the CIA had a program, and there's other programs. And that was told to a guy who had who'd won two Pulitzer Prizes. So this release is made in December, and the government admits, yes, we're investigating UFOs. And yet what they do is there's these conservative elements. So what they do is they say, you will never hear them use the word UFO. They use the word UAP, which is, a, which is an English word for um, un, um, unknown aerial phenomena. And they change the term. So when they're being interviewed by CNN, Fox, Washington Post, BBC, or whatever, they'll say, uh, they'll always call it ATIP, or the a UAPs, and they will never use the word alien. They'll do the interview and they'll say, we've discovered that there are UFOs, but we're not saying they're aliens. We're not saying it's ET. And they try to stay away from that. And they say, we're skeptical. We really don't know what's going on here. We just know that the government is investigating UFOs and the government is admitting they're investigating UFOs. And yet the government comes back when we went for the documents, the government goes back to the old position and says, we're not involved. So what they're doing is they're leaking it and the government's saying they're not leaking it. And it's impossible for us to confirm it, but they did confirm it to these high-level newspapers that this was going on. So we know there's a program, and what happened was some of the reporters came out, and this is basically my theory. I say they've been doing this for 70 years. They've been leaking this material for 70 years. So one of the reporters in the New York Times came out and said, where are they getting this idea? Where have they got this idea that there's some cabal that's leaking material into the UFO community? I mean, the, like we're crazy people that they can't figure this thing out, and we've got these conspiracy theories or whatever. And so I say, well, it's, it's actually pretty simple. On December 16th, 2017, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Politico, all three newspapers, major, major newspapers in the United States, who had never done UFO stories, they don't do UFO stories, they're very skeptical about UFOs, suddenly on one day, a story that takes two months to investigate, all three newspapers on the same morning all run with this major UFO story that the government is investigating UFOs, do you think that's coincidence? No, it was actually planned. They had these three newspapers planned to go with the story on the same day, major coverage. It went viral. The New York Times said it was one of the biggest stories they'd ever done uh, in terms of circulation. And so, of course, there's somebody behind this thing. This did not happen by accident. You'd have three newspapers that never did UFO stories who suddenly do a UFO story and they're not laughing. They're basically telling the truth that the government is investigating UFOs. Um, there's another example that shows that there's somebody behind this. This is not happening by accident. This is Bob Bigelow, who's a billionaire in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's the guy, if you look at the To The Stars and the A-Tip and all this sort of stuff, he now basically controls all the UFO material. In He's, he's a billionaire guy. He bought up. He has all the cattle mutilation material. He has uh, um, uh, a bunch of files from various researchers. All the A-Tip material. Uh, videos, f reports are all, he controls all that. He basically is like the guy in the movie Contact, this scientist who's in the background of this billionaire who's in the background. And so this is what he says in 2013. So this shows you in 2013, this was already in, in the works. They were planning this. He, he said, I think there is, sub rosa, an effort of sympathy 
towards this in other areas and other circles that might be government connected, that might feel that the time is right for a more honest delivery of the truth as to the evidence of the phenomena. So he says, I believe that there is people in the government who believe it is now time to start to tell people about UFOs. That's 2013, he's already talking about it, and you gotta remember, now he's the guy that controls all the material. So he was involved right there. He was the guy that had the ATIP contract from 2007 to 2012, gathered all the material for the US government, and then in 2013 he basically says, yeah, the government is gonna to start to let this stuff out. There's three major initiatives, as I said. This has been going on for many years. 73 was a documentary called uh, UFOs It Has Begun. I believe it was a CIA operation. There was a CIA agent on the set the entire time that they filmed this thing. Uh, a friend of mine produced it. They actually have eight seconds of a film called The Holman Air Force Base film that appears in the documentary. This is a film where aliens land at Holman Air Force Base. It's filmed from four different cameras and they, uh, the aliens get out, it's all filmed. And so that's one, 1988 is another thing that I firmly believe was the CIA uh, doing a documentary to drum, drop a bunch of stuff into the public. And all these things you can find on YouTube. The 73 one is called UFOs That Has Begun. You can find it on YouTube. The 1988 one is called UFO Cover Up Live. Uh, it was done by the CIA. There was a, a guy, it was called the Falcon, who was sort of indirectly confirmed to me that he was sitting on the set while they were filming this thing, and he was a big CIA guy. So it's the same thing. They dropped a bunch of material in there. This is where the term Area 51 comes from. You think that it came from the story with Bob Lazar? No, this was six months before the story was broken about Bob Lazar being on the base. Six months before, it was in this documentary on Fox TV. The other thing that was on there was the, uh, the, para, the remote viewing program that the US government ran, where they had these remote viewers going into past future, doing military targeting. Uh, at that time, it was run by the Defense Intelligence Agency, and in 1988, on that documentary, it's on a flowchart. The DIA parapsychology unit, it would not be declassified until 1995. So this classified unit appears on a flowchart. So this is how they drop the stuff in there. And 2017 is the one that's going on now with the New York Times, the Washington Post, all these videos that have been released. Uh, so Tom DeLong goes, as I said, Tom DeLong makes a contact with Lockheed Skunk Works. Lockheed Skunk Works has always been rumored to be the company that back engineers the flying saucers. He makes a contact, they invite him to a barbecue. They invite him to the barbecue. He doesn't invite himself. They invite him to the barbecue to introduce the president. He says, okay, if I can speak to the president for five minutes, I will do it. He goes to the president, he says, I've got this plan. I've got this plan to do something, to get out the word. And he doesn't use the word UFOs. And he said, can I come up and see you? The guy said, sure. Two weeks later, he posts this picture of Area 51. He's up at Area 51 without a security clearance, and he's talking to the top people at Lockheed Skunk Works. At first, they deny there are any such things as UFOs, and then they suddenly agree that, yes, this thing's for real, and they send him to Washington, D.C. to meet with two guys outside the Pentagon, and those two guys are CIA intelligence people, and it's those two guys that say to him, this kind of stuff does not happen at the White House. It does not happen in Congress. It happens when men like this meet in rooms like this and decide to move the football down the field. So he's, Lockheed Skunk Works lets him in. They send him to the Pentagon. They send him to NASA. NASA sends him to Ames on the West Coast. Then they send him to a general. Then they send him to another general. And what they do is they move him around and all these people link up with him and they start to feed him material. They start to leak the material and he uses his, he has a, a media uh, company and he does books, he does movies, he does all this kind of stuff and the idea is to use him to get this material out to the people. So he's on, at Area 51, then he meets a general at Colorado Springs. This is a general that basically asks him, what do you need? So this is a question, like what, how, do, how do we think there's somebody behind this disclosure that people are leaking stuff to people. Well, because Tom DeLong says, he was, he was basically told, what do you need? And they help him set up this group of people who are feeding him material. Um, he said, this is the one he got the email, he goes to the Pentagon, these two guys meet him in the room. Uh, this is the top guy. I'd known about him since 2015. He's only sort of come onto the public knowledge in the last year. His name is Jim Semivan. And what I always point out to people, when you're looking at this, these, all these stories about 
these leaks in the United States with Tom DeLong, you gotta remember that a lot of the people who are giving him material are experiencers. So Jim Semivan was a very high level CIA guy. He ran covert ops for the US government for two years. But what you gotta remember about him is he had the beings in his room in 1992. And his wife was there, he was there. Uh, he said it shattered his idea of what reality was about when suddenly these beings were in his room. So he's different than you sort of think it's the evil government guys who are doing whatever. Sometimes you gotta remember that there are people there who are just like you and I. They're down the rabbit hole and they're trying to figure out what's going on. So Jim Semivan, this very powerful guy, and he's the guy who's the director of To The Stars Academy now. He basically runs this thing. He discovered Tom DeLong and went in to help him get the message out. But I've known about him long before. I, I was told about him and the fact that, that he was interested in trying to get the word out. This is a key one, and I, I actually had some of this stuff in Denmark actually added to my story. I uh, actually got sort of um, a help on this. This is more important than I thought it was before. Um, Tom DeLong has an encounter with John Podesta. And if you, if you know who John Podesta is, he is the guy who ran Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. He was known as the most powerful person in the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, he had worked for Bill Clinton. Uh, and he was, when he was um, in the Clinton administration, he was known to be very interested in UFOs. He was very interested to be known as the X-Files man. The, the, the documentary stuff or the, the series X-Files, he would talk to reporters in the 1990s and tell them that whenever there was an X-Files uh, episode on TV, he didn't care what was going on at the White House. He was going home to watch X-Files. So he became known as the X-Files man, and I think he tried to talk Bill Clinton into disclosure. He's very much into open government. He's very much into... Uh, open, no secrets, this kind of stuff. He is the guy that, that ran Hillary Clinton's campaign, and he is, um, so John, so Tom DeLong contacts him, and he is, at the time, he's working for Barack Obama. He's a, he's a, a, a high level, he's the top advisor to Barack Obama. He's a lawyer, and he contacts John Podesta, and he sort of pitches in his program. I, I wanna do this kind of thing, and, and, and so uh, Podesta says, I'm kind of busy, phone me back in, in two months. Tom DeLong doesn't think he's got the message, he thinks he's messed it up. He doesn't phone him back, and two months later, uh, Podesta phones him back and basically um, says to him, I'll read it here. I didn't phone him back because I didn't think he was really absorbing what I was trying to pitch. Then all of a sudden, I got a flurry of emails from the office, from John's office, that he wanted to be in on this this disclosure plan that Tom was working. He wanted to be in on the disclosure plan. And I'm to come out to Washington, D.C. Tells Tom, fly to Washington. It's a major priority, and the rest is history. Now, what I've sort of put together since I came to Denmark is that there was actually a group of people. There was Hillary Clinton, there was John Podesta, and there was two other people that I wrote, really won't name because people will jump on me for getting the names wrong, but there was actually a group of people who were planning this disclosure, and the whole idea was that when Hillary became the president, they were gonna drop this thing, they were going to disclose this thing. And there was a team of four people, and I'm pretty sure I know who they were, at least four people on this team that were working this plan behind the scenes as to how they were gonna get this UFO story out. And Tom DeLong makes the contact, and they bring him in, maybe as a fifth person. John puts out this, this tweet, and, and this is, these are two very important tweets. John doesn't tweet very much, but he puts out this one, and he talks about, finally, this is the day he leaves the Obama administration. He puts this tweet out. He says, finally, my biggest failure of 2014, once, an, once again not getting the disclosure of the UFO files, which indicates I did it before. I tried to do it before, and that would be Bill Clinton. He tried to do it in the Bill Clinton administration. Bill Clinton wouldn't go with it, and he said, I tried it again, and it, it didn't work again. So he's basically saying, I tried to get the UFO files, and then he leaves and he, he becomes the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton. Then there's a second tweet, and I pulled it out and I'm gonna just tell you what it is. There's a second tweet that takes place. This is in February of 2015. Later in the year, Hillary Clinton is starting to run for president. She does an interview with a woman by the name of Lena Dunham. And after that interview, John puts out maybe even a more significant tweet than this. He said, good interview, Lena. Next time, ask her about the aliens. And that's important because you gotta realize to run for president of the United States, it's a billion dollar campaign. 
and a lot of stuff can go wrong. And the whole idea that you would bring up aliens in the middle of a presidential campaign, if that thing were to go south, if suddenly it all sort of, everybody thought Hillary was a crazy person, by talking about aliens, you would lose the campaign, you'd be, be over before it started. And you would go down in history as the stupidest person that ever lived by bringing up the word UFO. So the fact that John brought up the word UFO meant, number one, that he had, he had done a focus group. He had done a study where he got a bunch of people in the room and asked them, and it went positive. It wasn't a negative issue anymore. So he says, ask her about the aliens. Then what happens is, Hillary doesn't talk about it. You've heard the stories that Hillary talked about UFOs, but Hillary never brought the subject up. Hillary only answered questions. She answered three questions. After the, 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 the tweet to, um, to um, Lena Dunham, Hillary starts waiting for someone in the media to ask her the UFO question, because they're gonna drop this disclosure. They're gonna drop the UFO thing, and they're setting this thing up. So she go, she's supposed to go on the Kimmel Show, which is a big uh, comedy show in the United States, a, a talk show, late night talk show. And she's gonna go on the Kimmel Show, and Kimmel's very much into UFOs. Every time he gets Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or um, uh, people like that, he always says, you know, if I was the president, the uh, first thing I would do, man, before I even put my hand on the Bible, I, I put, I'd be, that the Bible would still be hot and I'd be running to find out where the UFO files are. And so every president, every high level person, he asks him this question, you know, what, what, did you look for the files? He asked Bush, he asked all these different people. So Kimmel's very interested. So Hillary in November of 2015 goes on the Kimmel show and she's waiting for him to ask the UFO question. And later in the WikiLeaks emails, it discloses the fact that she's waiting for it and they don't ask her and she's upset. And it says in the WikiLeaks email that she had practiced for five minutes. She had practiced this answer to the, to the whole thing and she didn't get asked the question. She doesn't get asked the question until March of 2016. So she's waiting for these, these questions to be, to be asked. And well, John says here, in one interview, he says, I talked to Hillary about that. There are still classified files that could be declassified. I think I convinced her that we need to have an effort to go and look at and declassify as much as he can. So he basically says, I talked to Hillary. I've convinced her that we have to declassify the UFO files. We've got to make it public. So then Hillary's waiting, and she gets, also, just before this slide, in the, the end of 2015, a friend of mine by the name of Damon Steer is the first person to ask her the UFO question. They're, they're in New Hampshire, which is the first primary state. This is when it all starts. And Damon Steer asks her, um, what, what do you think about UFOs? And she said, I, I, I'm in favor of it. I think we should disclose. And she goes into this whole thing. I think we should open this stuff up. So he asked the question. And a couple of weeks later, this comes out of the WikiLeaks emails. It's the most important WikiLeaks email there is. This is where it shows that there's a meeting that takes place. It's January 25th of 2016, and they have a meeting on UFO disclosure. John Podesta is running the meeting. His, wife, his, his secretary sets up the meeting. It's on a, what's called a go-to meeting. It's an internet uh, video chat thing where people come in. John doesn't know how to work it. His secretary sets it up for him, and they start bringing these people in. The people that attend the meeting, and we know because we've looked at the emails, we know these people were in this meeting, and they're all doing it on the internet. So John Podesta is there, Tom DeLong is on this meeting, and this guy who's a two-star general at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is in the meeting as well, and it's on UFO disclosure. The other guy that's is, is Robert Weiss. Robert Ra Weiss ran Lockheed Skunk Works. So you have the head of Lockheed Skunk Works in a UFO disclosure go-to meeting, the beginning of, of, of 2016, he's there, and, the final, and, the, and he's, it's very unusual that he's there, because when John Podesta was in the Clinton White House, he was being interviewed, and at one point he actually said, you know, I'm so interested in this, you know, I actually fair, I phoned Area 51 to find out what was going on, and they said, really nothing's going on. So in the 1990s, John Podesta is phoning Area 51 to find out what's going on, following this meeting, in February, uh, the month after this meeting, this, this, this meeting with uh, all these generals and stuff on UFO disclosure, Weiss writes to Tom DeLong and he says, is there any update which indicated that, that John Podesta had agreed to do something in the meeting and that they're waiting? So Weiss says, is there any update? So in 1990s, John Podesta is phoning Area 51 
And in 2017, Robert Weiss, who's at Lockheed, he's at Area 51, is now phoning John Podesta to find out what's going on. And they want this update. So Weiss shows up, and the third guy that showed up was, where is he? No, is, is a guy by the name of uh, General uh, McKay. So they have two generals, head of Lockheed Skunk Works, uh, John Podesta, and DeLong. And the meeting is on UFO disclosure, and they're just trying to decide how they're going to put this thing out. They're gonna, there's this plan, and McCaslin, the general from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, actually writes a memo, which is in the WikiLeaks emails, and he actually says, if you're gonna do this, the government should do this, and this, and this, and this, and he names off all the stuff that the government should do, how they should do UFO disclosure. So you have these very high-level people doing this. When this meeting takes place, a couple months later, Tom releases his book, so he's got six books. Three are fiction, three are nonfiction. This is the first sort of nonfiction book that he puts out. It's called Secret Machines Chasing Shadows. In that book, he puts it out, and supposedly ev everything breaks loose. The government is going, what is going on? Where did this guy get this material? And this material was all leaked to him by these generals. These people were putting stuff, and he was putting it in the book. So he gets the book, he puts the book out in April of 2016, and he's contacted by this Jim Semivan that I showed you before. Jim Semivan wonders what's going on, and according to Tom DeLong, one interview he did, he was taken to a hotel room in San Diego for two days. He sat in a hotel room, and there were six intelligence people in that room for two days, grilling him. Where did you get this? Where did you get that? How, who are you talking to? And in the end, they basically realize he's talking to McCaslin, Weiss, all these high-level people, and they actually join the team. And Tom De and, and Jim Semivan, the head guy that was, that was interrogating him, basically joins the team and becomes his head guy. So after that book, the, the Central Intelligence Agency starts helping, managing the program, putting material in there, and so you see how this thing unfolds. What I say is, and this is based on my 25 years experience with the president, I say the president knows and nothing happens unless the president authorizes it. The CIA does not run around and do a bunch of stuff on their own. They get permission from the president because if they don't, if something goes wrong, they did it and the president's gonna get blamed. Everybody knows the president is in charge. So here's what I think, you have these green lighting. So the president can't say anything. If he says something, then everybody's gonna start asking questions. And so you can't say anything. So indirectly, they do things in the background. And it's like green lighting. The president does something to basically indirectly say, okay, go ahead with it. One of the key interviews was this interview that was done in November of 2015. Barack Obama does an interview with GQ magazine. In the interview, they ask him a question. It has nothing to do with UFOs, and he volunteers to talk about UFOs. He's not asked about UFOs. The question is, have you ever said Give me the JFK assassination files. I want to read them. Give me all the secret stuff. Have you ever said to somebody, give me all the secret stuff? Because the president has no security clearance. The president can see whatever he wants. There is no security clearance for the president. So have you ever asked for all the secret stuff? So Barack starts talking about UFOs. He said, I got to tell you, it's a little disappointing. People always ask me about Roswald and UFOs and the aliens, and it turns out the, the stuff that's going on that's top secret isn't nearly as exciting as you'd expect. In this day and age, it's not as top secret as you would think. So basically he says the top secret UFO stuff isn't as exciting as you think. So he's basically declared the UFOs are real and it's top secret. And then the reporter, I always say, he either hit his head or had a stroke or something, fell asleep, and, and so he goes to the next question, would you like to be a Supreme Court Justice? He basically is handed the story, and he just goes on like he's reading the questions off the thing, and he goes to the next question, and nobody ever pursues Brock. So Brock is giving a green light. He's basically talking about UFOs, and there's a thing that, there's, this is known, there's, some articles have been written about this, that many legal experts agree that once the president speaks publicly about something, the information is effectively declassified. This happened with the stealth fighter, if you remember back many, many years ago. The stealth fighter became public. It was declassified because Jimmy Carter talked about it during his presidential campaign. As soon as he talked about the stealth fighter, boom, it's declassified. Everybody can talk about it. Barack Obama did this with the word Area 51. When they started using the word Area 51 was after Barack Obama gave an award to Shirley MacLaine, the famous actress in Hollywood. And she's into UFOs, big time. So what he comes and he's giving her an award at the Kennedy Center and he reads, he says, you know, when you become president, everybody always wants to know what's going on at Area 51. I didn't know, so I phoned Shirley MacLaine 
and everybody laughs, it's a big joke, and, and Shirley's laughing or whatever, and then he says, you know, I'm probably the first president ever to use the word Area 51 in public. At that moment, Area 51, everybody can talk about it because the president has outed it. And that's how the, how the game is played. So Barack is basically outing this thing. In December of 2015, Hillary's asked the first question. She gets very public and she has three questions asked her. And every one, she does not evade the issue. She says very clearly in the one interview in New York, called The Breakfast Club, there's an African-American guy sitting right beside her and she's talking and the guy says to her, you know, I think I've been abducted twice. And she goes, oh yeah. She says, I think I believe these people. I believe that they're telling the truth. I, they, they're not sitting in their kitchen making up stuff. So this guy basically tells her he's been abducted and she doesn't blink an eye. Yeah, I know that, I know what's going on. It's, it doesn't, <laughs> and she's very open about it. She's not covering up the this, this subject, but she only gets asked three times. Most people don't ask her. February of 2016, Barack does it again. And you gotta remember, in the, in the, in the old administrations, say the Kennedy or um, Johnson, Nixon, even Jimmy Carter, the president never used the word UFO ever. Jimmy Carter used it before he was elected, he used it after he was elected, but when they're president, they never use the word UFO. It's this deal, you don't want anybody asking you questions. But Barack talks about it all the time, he's always talking about UFOs. And here's one, this is girl, little girl's name is Macy. She comes on the Ellen Show and she's a, an expert. She's six years old, she's an expert. She knows everything about every president. So they bring Barack Obama on and then she's all excited and the president is there and stuff. And then they, Ellen says, well, what would you like to ask the president? And she said, I'd like to know, are there aliens? And of course, everybody laughs. And uh, Barack uh, says to her, uh, well, where do you learn that from? And she says, well, where do you get that idea? And she says, well, from a TV show and called the, the, the Book of Secrets. There's this rumor that the president is given a book of secrets, has all the secrets about everything in there. And of course they laugh again. I had a review done of this interview. As soon as it took place, I had a guy by the name of Ben Hansen, who's a F, former FBI guy who can read body language and stuff. I gave it to him and he said, they're reading off cue cards. And I went, whoa, and I, I did see this and they were, they were reading off cue cards. They were actually, this was actually planned before this happened. So when she asked the question, are there aliens? He says to her this, he says, the truth is Macy, we, and then he sort of stumbles, and he says, we, uh, um, we haven't actually made direct contact with aliens yet, but when we do, I will let you know. So Barack is talking, he's a green lighting, he's saying it's okay to talk about UFOs. And again, the president's talking about UFOs, so basically he's declassifying this stuff. February, 2016, or no, 17, basically the CIA who said that they've never been involved in UFOs, they don't do UFOs, suddenly put an article on the front page of their CIA and they, they say how to investigate a UFO sighting. And it's a straight up piece, how to investigate a UFO sighting by an agency that said they're not involved with UFOs. So they're doing these things, they're gradually talking about UFOs, getting it acceptable to talk about UFOs. 2017, Brock, Brock is leaving the office two days before he leaves the White House he drops 12 million pages of files onto the internet and a lot of them had to do with UFOs and remote viewing. So you can see they're doing this stuff, it's being happened in the background, you really know what's going on, but basically they're doing this stuff. And then this is a kind of a funny one, this, this happened after Brock left, but he like, as I said, he likes to talk about UFOs. He was raising money for some sort of foundation or something, and he's back on this Kimmel show, and Kimmel's always asking people about UFOs. So he says, you know, if you, if you donate to this thing, he says, he says, here's what I'm gonna do. He says, uh, I'll share my files on the aliens. I know how badly Kimmel wants to see the files on the aliens. And then some guy come off camera yells at him and goes, you can't do that. And then Brock says, but I have them right here, they're in my desk. And then the guy says, it's classified, you can't talk about that. And he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> so they're making these jokes, but indirectly he's talking about UFOs. And Brock was doing it all the time. Uh, so Hillary loses the election. And now they have to redo things because this was the whole plan. Hillary, John, they were gonna run this UFO thing. They were gonna drop this stuff. Hillary loses the election and they have to redo, rework everything. So it was supposed to, and I was told it was gonna happen before the election, just before the election, or just after the election, Hillary loses and they don't do it for nine months. So I was told it was supposed to happen and it looked like it took them a number of months to figure out, okay, Hillary's lost, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do this? And they start this operation and it's not until October of 2017 when Tom DeLonge has his famous news conference where he starts to talk about the fact that they've got these videos, they've got all this stuff, they're gonna, the government's gonna disclose all this stuff through him. 
and he, they start talking about the ATIP program. So there's four different components to it. There's the reports. I'm not going to talk about that. There's 38 reports. Some are as long as 490 pages. Um, these are basically on theoretical propulsion, how they might be getting here. There's the videos, and there's three videos that have been released, and um, I'm going to show you one in a second. Then there's the hardware, which I'll talk about a little bit. There's all sorts of alien hardware that has been recovered, and they're working on this. This uh, To the Stars Academy uh, has been working on this, and it was all gathered through the ATIP program. But the final one I'm going to talk about is the Experiencer thing, and these are the, the, most people don't know that there's a group that's actually working with experiencers, people who have interacted with the phenomena, and that's what I'll spend some time doing. This has got to do with this question about the president. The president knows what's going on, but they don't want you asking the president anything because they, it all unravels. If you suddenly know that the president is the wizard behind the curtain, it's all over. I mean, it's like 5,000 reporters descend on the White House and start asking questions, and it all unravels. So they want you to think that the evil cabal is behind the cover-up because you're gonna chase the evil cabal till the second coming. You are never gonna find it because there is no evil cabal. It's the president that's running it and they want you down some dark alley where you're not causing any trouble. So what happens is once the ATIP program is made public and the New York Times, Washington Post come out and say, the government has admitted they're doing UFOs and they've got these films and they're investigating all this stuff. The guy on the bottom right hand corner, Jordan Fabian from the Hill is in the White House press room. These three people, when Hillary, the, top, the other three people, when Hillary started talking about disclosure, those people asked questions in the White House press room. They started asking questions, what's going on? Is the government covering us up? When this thing becomes public, Jordan Fabian asks Sarah Sanders, who's Donald Trump's press secretary, um, what does Donald Trump think about UFOs? And secondly, is he going to refund this program? Is he going to keep funding this program to investigate UFOs? Sarah Sanders says to him, I haven't talked to the president about that. I'll talk to him and I'll get back to you. And I knew instinctively she would never get back to him. And I've gone to Jordan Fabian, I've contacted him, he's not contacted me back, and I've said, have you gotten an answer? Because he went after the press conference, and he talked to Sarah Sanders, and she said, because this story was breaking all over the place, all this UFO disclosure stuff, she said that we knew that somebody might ask the question, but we didn't think anybody would. So she knew the question was, might be coming. They never got back. And the reason they haven't got back is you can't have Donald Trump talking about UFOs. It all unravels if he suddenly starts talking about UFOs. So she never did get back. And Jordan Fabian actually said in one interview that if he had the chance to do it over, he wouldn't even ask the UFO question. So the reporters are very, very sensitive. They're, nobody wants to ask the dumb UFO question. The reporters aren't really pushing the scene, but Donald Trump was asked about UFOs. Um, this is my thing, I say the president is in charge. He has no security clearance, he's the head of state. If you're dealing with Denmark, it's only the president can deal with, with Denmark. If you're dealing with aliens, it's only the president. You can't deal with a foreign power, it has to be the head of state. You can't have a, a, a lower level government official dealing with foreign powers. He's the civilian commander of the military. If the military is running it, he's the civilian commander of the military. If it's the government, he's the chief executive officer of the government, and he's the head of all 17 intelligence agencies. So no matter who's running the cover-up, the president is at, to at the top of every single pyramid. And so I say the president is there, they just want you to think the president doesn't know. He doesn't know about Russia, he doesn't know about Monica Lewinsky, he doesn't know about Whitewater, he doesn't know about UFOs, because they're subjects they don't want the president to be talking about. Here's where Tom DeLong, he has the press conference and he starts talking about the videos. We've got these videos, we're gonna be releasing these videos that have been captured by the US military. Leslie Kane meets with, uh, she's one of the New York Times reporters and when she was brought in, the significant thing is here, they brought the reporters in from the Washington Post, from the New York Times and in Leslie Kane's, the description was there was in the room with several present and former intelligence officers and a defense contractor. So the question was, well, how do we know that they're leaking this stuff to the New York Times? Because the New York Times said they were leaking it, that they went to, they flew to Washington and a bunch of people, high level government officials sat in the room, they showed them documents, they showed them videos, and basically I think they gave them two independent confirmations off the record that this thing is for real and they ran the story and the rest is history. But the idea that this thing is happening by accident and that there's nobody behind it, absolutely. The New York Times, this is from the New York Times, said that these people were in the room and they were feeding them the story. So here's the video, here's one of the videos. It actually, I showed it already in October of 2017. 
It's actually a Nimitz video, which was a Nimitz aircraft carrier battle group that was off the coast of California. They send up two F-18s. They run. A, they sort of run low on gas. They send a second set of F-17 or F-18s, and they capture this object through their sort of like the gun camera uh, thing. And they're they're watching this object. And so what they do is they take that film, and first they leaked it in 2007 to a German uh, website, and it was leaked there. And then they bring out the the to the stars brings that out again, except it's changed. You'll hear the 2007 version has no noise. The one that, had, that Tom DeLonge has, has like a vacuum cleaner going in the background. And so it's not really the, um, it's the same thing. And I think they altered, they may have altered the video to say that it's, it's not the right video. It's, it's, a, it's a hoax, but it is the video just with noise. So this is the, they're picking up this object through the gun camera footage and they've now released three different videos. One from the, the Nimitz off in 2004 and two from 2015 off the East Coast. Now the FOIAs, um, when they released all this stuff, the New York Times released all this stuff, of course UFO researchers start looking for the Freedom of Information Act requests. So we start looking for the documents. We go to the government, we say, where's these videos? Where's these documents? Who is running the program? And basically what it comes back is, is the, they basically say, we didn't release any documents. And they say, we don't have any records. We don't, have, we don't know what you're talking about and they start playing this game. So, and the, the key to that is, they're still doing the plausible deniability with us that the government isn't doing anything, we're not involved, but they go to the New York Times and through their secret sources, they say, off the record, this is for real. The New York Times, if they had what the UFO community has, which is nothing, they would not have run with the story. They had to have gotten some sort of direct confirmation that this is for real, and they saw the documents. The UFO community has not seen the documents that the New York Times saw. We have not seen the documents that were shown to the Washington Post. We're still in the dark, we're still fighting, and now, as I pointed out right at the beginning, suddenly the name of the program, it's no longer ATIP, it's this other name. It's like, oh, you had the wrong name. They were using the wrong name as they were putting this stuff out. So the UFO community got very frustrated. The John Greenwald, who's the expert, He's done 8,000 FOIAs, he's very frustrated. I worked with him and he's very determined that he's going to get to the bottom of this, but we have gotten no confirmation of this thing, but major news media is running with it. So the story is for real. Uh, this is what Harris the, uh, at the Pentagon says. Uh, there's been no release. We have not released any videos. Uh, this is Lou Elizondo. He's the sort of the key guy who ran the ATIP program and they have actually avoided the UFO community. Uh, what I was, what, what we were told by Jim Semivan was that uh, he was supposed to attend the UFO Congress, which is a big conference in the United States, UFO conference, where there's up to 1,500 people register for this in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, he was told not to go. He was told, they're going to ask you a bunch of hardball questions, and when you answer the questions, you're an intelligence agent, not going to believe you anyway, so why would you go? So basically, the idea is, they're not trying to convince you, they're not trying to convince me, they could care less what the UFO community thinks because we're just gonna ask a bunch of stupid questions, they don't care. What they have done is they've gone to the media and it's like a vote. If you have the conservative party, the liberal type party, the liberals aren't gonna vote for the conservatives, the conservatives aren't gonna vote for the liberals, so when you are running your campaign, all you're interested in is the swing voters, the people who don't really know whether they're on one side or the other side, so what they've done is we already have decided. We're on one side of the equation. They don't need to convince us. What they're doing is they're going through the major media, dropping the story into the major media, and they're trying to get the people in America who go, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't, and then they see the videos and they go, oh, they do. They're shifting the mentality, the thoughts of the American people towards one side of the, of the story. That's what they're doing. And they won't deal with us. They won't, they won't give interviews. They won't talk to us and uh, we have to sort of figure it out from the side. It's not an issue, it's not something directed at the UFO community. This is what I'm saying, they're doing confirmation. So what they had said, Bob Bigelow had said already in 1993, he was asked, and this is this big business guy who owned the contract that did all the, the investigation for the US government on UFOs. He was asked in 2013, he said, he was asked, are you in favor of disclosure? And he said, no, I'm not. He said, I'm in favor of confirmation. What you do is you just tell the American people, we have a phenomena, it's real, and you stop right there. Years down the road, you go to disclosure. Who are they, where they're coming from, but at the beginning, you just say, there's a phenomena, and it's real, 
and you stop right there. That's exactly what they've done. They went to the New York Times, they put the story. When they start talking, they're saying, we're not, it's not alien, we're not saying it's ET, we're just saying there's a phenomena. So they're doing, this is what they've done. They've done confirmation. They're just confirming to the American people that the story is real. There are UFOs. This is what they should have done in 1947. <coughs> Instead, in 1947, they decided to lie and say there's nothing to this, we're not investigating anything, and they got into this 70-year lie that now they're trying to work their way out of by starting in 1947 and just simply saying from the beginning, yes, there's a phenomena, we don't know what's going on, but yes, there is a phenomena that is, that is interacting with the human race. Now, I'm just take two more minutes and I'm gonna go through the medals. Uh, there's been a bunch of discussion about medals. There was a story, New York Times put out the fact that Bob Bigelow had built some security, uh, some facilities in Las Vegas to store all the material. What I believe it is, it's to store top secret material. If you handle cl classified material, you have to have what's called a SCIF, a secure com uh, compartmentalized information facility and you, to, to get it. You can't just take top secret material and run it out of somebody's house or a, bu a building. You have to build these things. So what they're, they're talking about, they have these metals in there, they have um, all this kind of stuff. And Hal Putoff admitted that he had touched this metal and this metal is very unusual. Implants, they, they have, I'm sure they've got some of the implant material, which is um, implants that are taken out of people who are experiencers. And this appears usually on the, on the left side of the body, and they've, they've worked on that, and it's very, very strange material. And um, so they, they, this is the other type of metal. This is the most interesting one. This is metal that has been recovered from UFOs. This has gone over 70 years. You'll hear these stories, if you look in history, of a UFO, and it looks like it's gonna crash. The UFO is sort of flipping around, and the person's watching this UFO, and it looks like it's gonna crash, and they're waiting for it to crash, and all of a sudden, two more UFOs come in, stabilize the craft, make it stable again, then it shoots out this molten metal onto the ground, and then they all fly away. And this has happened many times through history, that this exact story has taken place. And then the, usually the person grabs the metal and they, they take the metal to, a, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they take it to somebody and they say, ah, oh, it's just iron, it's slag, you made this up, all this sort of stuff. And they've now started to realize that this metal that these people have recovered over the last 70 years is very, very unique. It has weird isotopes. And basically what they're saying, they're calling it meta materials. And they're not, and again, they're saying it's not ET, we're not saying it's ET, we're not saying it's UFO, we're just saying that we cannot build this metal on Earth. The interesting thing about this is if you look at all these metals, you look all the way down, and then you add the, Ro the Roswell material, the stuff that you could crumble up in a little ball, open it up, the, the memory material, some material that I've handled, I'll show you in a second, every single piece is different, which makes me think that it may have nothing to do with UFOs at all. This was a game. It was like the, the UFOs pretending it's like a bird that's got a broken wing and they're trying to get you away from the nest. They're trying to get your attention. They throw the metal and all it is is to make you think that it really may have nothing to do with the UFO. They just say, oh, well, let's give them a piece that has weird isotopes. <laughs> they flip this out and all the, the people pick it up and they make us think, almost like UFOs. Why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. They could turn the lights off and you'd not see them. They turn the lights on so you can see them. If you see a UFO, you're part of the game. It's not a random event, and, and this is what I think is happening here, that I've never, as I go through it, I can't think of two pieces of metal, UFO metal, that have been recovered that are the same. They're all different, almost like this is part of a game. So this is part of the metal that they have, and Jacques Vallée is, is working on, on this kind of stuff. This is the piece that I got. It comes from a crash site in New Mexico, and there's a, a guy from NASA, it's a long story, it takes two academics, professors from a university, they blindfold them, take them to the site, and I'm thinking, what? I'm, we, my friend showed this guy where the site was. Now he's taking people there, and they had all sorts of metal that was recovered. Now, I'm not sure where the Bigelow has these pieces of metal, but they recovered a number of pieces of metals from this site. So metal is not that uncommon, and the, the To the Stars Academy claim that they're going to show, I think it's the next piece up here, this piece. The To the Stars Academy, Tom DeLong has come public and he has said that they're going to release, uh, they're going to show, I think, this piece. Tom DeLong says it's 80 layers thick. Uh, Linda Howe tells me, no, it's 37. It's called Arts Parts. It was recovered a number of years ago. And what it is, is it's the same thing. It's this bizarre metal that we know we can't make. It's, it's, it's magnesium and bismuth. So it's, it's one, one to four microns of, of bismuth absolutely pure, that we cannot develop. One to four microns, then 100 microns of magnesium, then uh, bismuth, magnesium, and these levels. And it's all built in these levels, 80 or 36, whatever it is. 
and it's tapered at the corner. And what Tom DeLong says is that they're gonna have an experiment where they're gonna bring this piece of metal out and they're gonna bombard it with energy and that the electron will move slower across the surface after they bombard it. This is what we know in the UFO field as, as the Oz effect. If you read UFO stories of people who are very close to a UFO, they'll all describe the same thing as John Lennon, the, the Beatle, the musician, his girlfriend was there when it happened. It was like time just sort of slows down and you don't know what's going on and it's this idea that it has to do with this metal. So they say they're gonna show this metal. Whether they show it, we'll, we'll see. But they, they're gonna show 26 videos. They've got 26 videos. They say they're gonna drop these videos one at a time from various uh, military operations. They're gonna show this piece of metal. And this is what Tom DeLong says their disclosure is gonna involve. And then I even talked to a guy, I had an email today from a guy who said he had, was under a um, non-disclosure agreement. And I'm going like, why are we putting non-disclosure agreements with, with people who aren't even you know, researchers? But they have this stuff that they're going to bring out. Um, that's what Tom DeLong, these are the two uh, new um, videos that may be coming from NASA. Uh, I just want to show this story and then we'll take a break. This is a story that I've kept uh, for 40 years. This happened with Charlie Red Star in the 1970s. Um, the guy on the right is James Irwin. The guy on the left is um, Scott. Uh, they're from Apollo 15. And I was, as I said, I was told this story 40 years ago, and I have only started retelling the story in the last couple of days because I'll show you there's been a development. So my friend, uh, this town had all these sightings. Half the town had seen this thing. The guy who ran the airport, his name is Bob Demert. And Bob Demert um, had an encounter with James Irwin. James Irwin had come to lecture at the, the school there. It wasn't on UFOs. It was on the Apollo program. He had come to lecture, and he was interested in Bob because they both rebuilt old World War II planes, like Japanese Zeros and stuff. And they both were in this industry, and he wanted to talk to Bob. So Bob tells me the story. He's in one of the hangars, and James Irwin is there. And he said, when my wife Elaine left the hangar, James Irwin looked over at me, and he said, Bob, I'm going to tell you a story. If you ever repeat it, I will deny I ever said it. He said, when we landed on the moon, an object landed near the craft, near the, 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 the capsule. And he said, they were looking at it, and then they, he radioed Houston, and he said, Houston, something has just landed here, and we'd like to take the rover over and go and say howdy. And Houston said, hang on. And they came back on 30 seconds, and they said, you're instructed to go about what you're to do and ignore it. So they went through the whole thing, and James Irwin told Bob that when they left the moon, that thing was still sitting there. Now, that was a story, and then later on, I had an encounter with um, a guy named Frank Stranges. He was uh, a big researcher in the United States, but he was also a religious minister. And I had heard that James Irwin had pulled out of a lecture that he had given, they were supposed to give. So I, I finally got a hold of uh, Frank Stranges, and I said, did James Irwin pull out of a lecture? He said, yes, it was gonna be in Los Angeles, California. He pulled out the day before. I said, he said, he gave me the, the check back, and he said, I can't do this. And um, I said, what was he going to lecture on? And he said he was going to lecture on what happened on the moon. So he pulled out and he said, I can't do it. I have a pension. I just can't do it. I, I have to give you the check back. So that was the second one. The third one has just come in the last month. There's a friend of mine from Toronto, Canada, who I know has contact with astronauts. He still hasn't told me where he got this from. But James Irwin had four children. He's now dead. He has four children, and one of them, whose name is Jan, I'm not sure whether it's a boy or a girl, Jan draws this. Oh, oh this is a picture. I went back to the, uh, if you look on the Apollo 15 videos on the moon, I actually pulled this off one of the videos. So you can see this object, whether that's the object or not, I'm not sure, but there is actually something on the film that looks like, a, like an object near the, the, near the craft. But anyway, this is the, the, the thing that was drawn by James Irwin's child. Six years old, and you see them on the moon. You see Scott Irwin, and you see all these aliens in behind, which sort of confirms the story I was told 40 years ago that something landed on the moon on Apollo 15. Now I'm going to get into the stuff I think is important, and it's really weird stuff. How many people are familiar with the uh, free, the free the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters? It's a group that was started by a guy named Ray Hernandez and uh, former Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell. And in their stats, um, I had already known that experiencers are the people I say you've got to listen to. Um, they will give you all the answers. Unlike the government, they will tell you what's going on. Um, they won't be covering up stuff. 
they're interested in you knowing, and they're being told stuff. In that, uh, they get the, the survey that was done, there's about 4,000 experiencers now that have been involved answering questions. Some of them have actually answered up to 675 questions. And what they're looking for is similarities. So we know some very important things that have done. For example, I mentioned earlier that 39% of all people who answered the question said they were shown on board the ship a screen where these environmental images of us destroying the world were shown. 40% of all experiencers at one point during their experience said they knew the answer to everything in the universe. And that's something you're not going to make up. You're going to make up some story. You're not going to add that stupid thing into it. And that's critically important because if that's true, why would you not talk to these people? And as I said before, when I went from the nuts and bolts, I was doing documents, I was doing the president, all this kind of stuff. And when I went to this aspect of consciousness, of talking to experiencers, there's a big aspect, part of the UFO community doesn't want anything to do with this. And they say, well, these experiencers, people who say they've interacted with the beings, it's anecdotal. It doesn't mean anything. They just believe that they've had these experiences. It's not really happening. And so what I would say is if you have 4,000 experiencers and of the people who answered the question, 40% say they knew the answer to everything in the universe, don't you think you should at least talk to them? I don't care if you put them under lie detectors or what you do, but that's a lot of people saying something that could be very, very important. 42% of all experiencers say they've got mathematical, technical, or scientific material in their head that they did not learn in school. I had a woman I'm about to do contact in the desert. The last time I was at contact in the desert, big conference with 4,000 people at it. Um, a woman came up to me and I was doing sort of the lecture I'm gonna do right now and said, look at this, shows me her cell phone. And I said, oh, this is paper, 25 pages long. So I started going through it. It's got all these mathematical formulas and stuff. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. You get that in the download, Do you get that? She said, yeah. She says, the thing is I'm a secretary. I've never taken science. And she had written this paper, 25 pages of all these formulas and stuff. And she said, she didn't write it, it came into her head. So when you get 42% of people who say they've got downloads, 50% say they've healed someone or they've been healed by the phenomena. Very, very important stats where you start looking at this and you say, we can actually determine something from this if we at least talk to them. The one that interests me the most, and the I'll give credit to, to the stars, is they have a group that is looking at these experiencers. And one of the reasons may be that Gary Nolan from Stanford University, who is one of the people, is an experiencer. And that's why I say, you've got to keep in mind when you're looking at these programs, is there somebody in there who's an experiencer, someone who's had an experience? Because if, you've, if you have 10% of the people in the public who have seen a UFO in high-level government, there's 10% of people in high-level government who have seen a UFO. If there's 2% of people who have been abducted in the general population, there's 2% of people in high-level government who have been abducted. So they're looking at these experiences, but the stat that I was most interested in is this one. The question is, do you recall operating a UFO craft? 14% of all the experiencers who answered that question said, yeah, I flew the flying saucer. And I remember when I first had my consciousness download, I gave my first consciousness lecture in Phoenix, Arizona, and they said to me, and I'm gonna play her in a minute, they, they wanted me to meet this woman by the name of Pam. They said, are you still gonna talk to Pam? And I said, yeah, I'll talk to Pam. And I thought I must have agreed to talk to her or whatever. They said, that's good. She's coming to the house on Monday and I was staying at this house. This woman, she's in her 70s, very, fairly elderly, came along. And she said, what did Stacy tell you about me? And I said, I don't know, I'm just supposed to talk to you. She said, that's good. Comes walking in. And when you're in the UFO business, you hear lots of weird stories and nothing's really that unusual. And she was a remote viewer, she'd been abducted, she had this, she, she'd been to outer space, all this kind of stuff, and I'm listening to it. And then she said, and I, last night I was flying the craft. And I went, you were what? She said, I was flying the craft. I said, you flew the flying saucer? She said, oh yeah, I've, I've flown three different models. And I said, they let you fly the flying saucer? And she said, yeah, I've flown it three different models. I've flown them for years. And so what, what's left to say? I said, 
So how do you fly a flying saucer? And she said, you do it with your mind. And suddenly I went, oh, that's why they wanted me to talk to her. Because I had a download experience in 2012 that said, with absolute certainty, and this is the hardest thing to explain to you, it came with absolute certainty. Do not question this. This is how it works. And the download said, it's consciousness. That, remember I was saying, 1975, I was rejected, the manuscript was rejected. All I wanted to know is somebody must know what's going on. At that moment, I got the answer. It said, this download, and I'll describe it in a second, this download basically said, it's consciousness. It's non-local consciousness. This is the answer you've been looking for. So when I found these people were flying the craft with their mind, I went to free and I said, we, we should look at these people. We should, you know, and they said, well, people say all sorts of things that they happen on the ship. I said, well, yeah, they can say lots of things that happen when they're on the ship. But when they start flying the ship and they're using their mind, don't you think we should talk to them? And so I started this pursuit and now I've got 48 people that I have talked to, read about, got a file on who have flown the craft. And every time someone says, a woman will come to me, and I always say, if you believe in evil aliens, you gotta explain this. In Saudi Arabia until last year, it was illegal for a woman to drive a car. But if she gets abducted by a UFO, they'll let her fly the ship, no license, no insurance, just go ahead, fly the ship. <laughs> and so when, when, when you had this kind of stuff happening, and every time someone, mostly it was women, they'd come to me and they'd say, I, I had this dream I was flying the craft. And I'd say, okay, stop. How do you fly a craft? Nobody. Not one person out of 48 has said anything different. They just say, oh, you do it with your mind. And so I started looking at this phenomenon. So I'm going to show you this. I'm going to play you some tapes of some people who actually told me this story. There's two models of the universe. This is what it comes down to to me. There's, there's, there's a model of the universe that says everything is nuts and bolts. And the majority of the UFO community, the majority of the scientific community is still in this world. This world that it's all just nuts and bolts, it's random, it's meaningless, consciousness comes as a, a byproduct of the brain, all this kind of stuff. Or, and if that's right, then you have one world. But if the world is built on consciousness instead of matter, which is the other theory, everything changes. Everything that you think about has changed. You have to look at the whole world differently. So there's these two different models, and I'm working on the model that consciousness is primary. When I first, when I was putting this out, a, a top physicist in, in California who's into UFOs basically said, well, Grant's got this naive view of material, mat, uh, materialism. So I'm going to quote from high-level quantum physicist who invented it. Erwin Schrodinger, who was one of the guys who invented quantum physics, said, consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms, for consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. And that's the key. Consciousness is fundamental. You have consciousness, then you have matter. Not the other way around. And that, so it's not me, my naive view. This is from Guy Won the Nobel Prize. This is uh, Amit Goswami. You'll see his videos. They're very good on, 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 on YouTube. He said, now the opposite view is that everything starts with consciousness. That is, consciousness is the ground of being. In this view, consciousness imposes downward causation. So consciousness starts and everything that flows from consciousness, everything that appears in the universe is coming from consciousness. There's actually 21 scientists who have actually broken loose. The problem with this thing is in the, in the scientific world, the material world is paradigm. You can't, you can't say it's not a material world. And so if you do, then you're going to lose your grants. Uh, you're not going anywhere. You're going to lose your job. You're going nowhere in the scientific community if you suddenly say that consciousness is primary and that matter is secondary. There's actually 21 scientists who have, scientists and psychologists and stuff in the United States who have actually broken. They've signed a manifesto for the post-materialist uh, science. And they're basically saying, Matter is not primary. So the movement has actually started to take place where some people are starting to step forward and say, no, the idea that it's a nuts and bolts world made out of little tiny particles is not right. Give you some examples how this fits in to the UFO world. Phenomenology, uh, Ron Pendolfi, I mentioned this guy who was the head CIA guy, first thing started to in, uh, interact with Dan Smith in 1991. It's at that point that he told Dan Smith, we have a phenomenology problem. And phenomenology is this thing where it's all UFOs, ghosts, remote viewing, near-death experiences. In fact, if you take a look at the relationship between abductees or people who are experiencers 
and near-death experiences, the national average is 5%. But people who claim they're experiencers interacting with the beings, the, the average for near-death experiences is 37%, seven times the national average. And the question is, why is that happening? And I say it's because it's not a random event. You think it's a random event, but you have this connection. So what the CIA said in this thing, we have a phenomenology problem, and because we cannot measure and control the phenomena, we have to watch the people who the phenomena affects. So they're watching people who are interacting with the phenomena because there's nothing else they can do. They can't interact with the phenomena, so they watch the people, and they're generally people on the street who are interacting with the phenomena. This is Jim Semivan, the guy who's running to the Stars Academy. Here's what he says, and remember, he's an experiencer. He said, I am very much aware, particularly in regard to the phenomena, and they call it the phenomena, that this measured and linear approach, that's the scientific method, we have to be able to measure it and touch it and feel it and all this kind of stuff. The idea with this, this leisure, measured and linear approach is arguably laughable. How do you make sense of it when there does not appear to be any there there? The phenomena seems to work on another level, consciousness, dimensions, unknown to our science. That's the guy that runs to the stars. So I have, I'm optimistic. If that guy is running it, and he's been an experience, he's had the beings in his room, he understands the principle of consciousness. The Skinwalker Ranch, how many people, people know the Skinwalker Ranch, Bob Bigelow? The Skinwalker Ranch, he bought it. You gotta remember, Bob Bigelow has all the money in the world, he has all the scientists in the world, anybody, he can hire anybody he wants. And this was in 75 square acres, so it was in a very small situation, all the best scientists, all the best money, and one of the reasons he sold Skinwalker Ranch is because they could not determine anything. The expression was not only did the phenomena know what they were doing, the phenomena knew what they were about to do. So they couldn't tape anything. They would have one camera facing another camera. It would rip down the wires off this one while something was going on this one. They couldn't do, not do anything, so they basically, one of the reasons they sold the ranch was because it was a waste of time. They, could, they couldn't measure anything. And that's the whole idea is that we cannot measure and control the phenomena. We have to watch who the phenomena affects. So that's the, the key is that, that it's a phenomena that's way past the physical world. If it was a physical phenomena, you'd be able to do it. The other thing about Bob Bigelow, people know that he gave a lot of money into the UFO community. What most people don't forget or forget or don't even know is that he put up $3.7 million to the University of Las Vegas, Nevada for a chair in consciousness studies. He knows what's going on. He knows consciousness is at the bottom of this thing. Uh, this is my download experience. I had three things that came into my head instantaneously. They just all went together. They were things that I had gathered together during my life, but what happened is something just put the pieces together and said, there it is. And it just, oh, there, it all made sense. This is a top secret government document. This is one of the only top secret UFO documents in the world. It's a Canadian government document. It was written in the Department of Transport, 1950, November 1950. The Canadian government does not deny this. It's in the Canadian government archives. This is a real document. The Canadians, the guy who ran the Canadian program was a contactee. He was talking to the aliens. And he went to the United States. He was a high-level security clearance. He was the guy that sort of ran the NSA, the monitoring Russian communications in Canada. He went down to the United States and he asked them, what's the deal with flying saucers? The answer he got is on this memo. It said, we were told by American officials, not people on the street, not secretaries, American officials, flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. There's a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush who's trying to figure out what's going on, and it's of tremendous significance to the Americans. What popped into my head during this download experience was the next line in the document, which said we were also told by American officials that other things might be associated with the flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. And the Americans aren't doing very well because they've said they're willing to talk to us. In 1950, the key thing is now we know aliens are telepathic. In 1950, there was nobody talking to aliens. The first contactees, Adamski and Williams would not appear until a couple of days after the detonation of the hydrogen bomb in 1952. Betty and Barney Hill's story wouldn't become public until the 1960s. There was nobody running around in 1950 talking about telepathic aliens. They, somehow, the American government knew that mental phenomena was involved in the UFO phenomena. And I believe the reason they probably did 
was that 1947, one of the big stories now, is that they recovered a live alien. And the alien was talking in people's heads. And that may be where all the security comes from, is if you suddenly recover an alien and it's talking in your head, you go, wow, would we like to have that? Because we can go to Putin and we can say, you're talking to God. I'm here and I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And that, for the military, is unbelievable technology. So the Americans knew in 1950 that mental phenomena. That was the first thing that popped into my head. The second thing that popped into my head is a conversation with Ben Rich. Ben Rich gives a, a lecture at UCLA, 1993, to the engineering alumni. During that lecture, he says, we now have the technology to take ET home. One of the people in the room was Jan Hartson, who's now the international director from MUFON. Jan Hartson, again, is an experiencer. He was 30 or 40 feet away from a UFO in his backyard when he was nine years old. He was like me, he was obsessed. He wanted to know, he became an electrical engineer, he wanted to know, how do flying saucers get here? How does the propulsion system work? So when Ben Rich stands up and says, we have the technology to take ET home, the questions were asked, Ben's heading for the door, it's all over, and he said, this is my one chance. He goes running after Ben Rich, and he said, Ben, I need to know, I've worked on it my whole life, I need to know, how do they get here? How does the propulsion system work? And Ben turns around, he looks at me, he said, I got a question for you. How does ESP work? And then Jan goes, I didn't expect a question. And he said, uh, it means everything in time and space is connected. And he said, that's how it works. Walks out, gets in his car and drives away. That was the second piece that came into my head. The third piece that came into my head was this guy. I mentioned him, Dr. Eric Walker. We chased him for eight years. This is two years before Ben Rich. There's a guy from Great Britain who's interviewing him and he's asking about MJ-12, the control group. Is it just 12 guys? Is there more than 12 guys now? Is it Americans? Is it international? And then uh, Walker says, let me ask you a question. And the guy in Great Britain says, what? What do you know about ESP? And the guy went, uh, well, he didn't have an answer. So Walker answers his own question. He said, look, unless you understand about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in by the control group. Very few people understand how it worked. So from 1991 till 2012, when they had that download experience, I had no idea what Walker was talking about. When that download experience I went, I went, that's what he's talking about. They're all talking about the same thing. It's ESP. It's non-local consciousness. This is how it works. This guy was an assistant secretary of defense. He worked for Eisenhower. He ran the, the, the top think tank military think tank in the country, he was the chairman of the board, 14 honorary doctorate degrees. This was not some low-level guy. He knew what was going on, and he basically said, I can't talk about it, but he gave us this one clue and said, it's ESP, you gotta understand ESP. So I had this download experience, and I start to pick up, the woman comes to me, says she's flying the craft with her mind. Tom DeLong says the same thing. He goes to Lockheed Skunk Works. Remember I showed that picture of the, the Area 51 gate? He goes to Lockheed, he's talking to the top people at Lockheed who are supposedly back engineering the flying saucer, and the guy says to him, after they finally admit that UFOs exist, he says, okay, I just wanna know, how do they work? And Tom says, well, I got some ideas. And he said, okay, go ahead. So Tom gives him an idea, and then the guy says, well, that's pretty good, got anything else? And then Tom says, you know what? I think consciousness is involved. And the guy said, now you're talking. And he said for 45 minutes, they talked about consciousness and the head scientist at Lockheed Skunk Works, according to Tom DeLong said, that's all the guy wanted to talk about. It is the key. So you have Lockheed, this big company in the United States that's doing the back engineering, is talking about it as well. Tom talks about, when he talks about that metal, I showed that layered piece of metal, Tom DeLong says that when they show this metal, he's talking about the metal. He says it's atomically aligning the elements so consciousness and other types of things can move through those materials to operate the craft. So again, he's relating that metal that it's aligned properly so consciousness can go through to fly the craft. So he's talking about flying the craft and he's also talking about consciousness being involved. This is a dual slit experiment. This is when the material world started to fall apart. This is a famous experiment that was done many, many years ago. And the whole idea is they're shooting these electrons through these, these two slits and this wave pattern forms on the back wall. And it doesn't make any sense because if, if particle, if electrons or photons are, are particles, then you shouldn't get a wave pattern. You should get a pattern of like BBs on, you know, like spots on the back wall. So they got this, and they're trying to figure out now, why are we getting this wave pattern? So then they shoot one electron at a time, or one photon at a time, through the slit, and they still, they're still getting the wave pattern. They're only shooting one, one at a time, and they're figuring, why is this wave pattern? So what they do 
is they put an observer, and they're trying to figure out which slot is the photon going through. And as soon as they put the observer to watch which slot it's going through, suddenly they get the wave pattern. They take the observer off, they get the particle pattern. Take the observer off, wave pattern. Put the observer back on, particle pattern. Which basically, in the end, according to me, indicates that when there's an observer, the material particle appears on the back wall. As long as there's no observer, there's no physical world. That the part, it's not the particle on the back wall that's making the observer appear, it is the observer that's making the wave turn into a particle. So you need consciousness is at the basis. And this is this whole thing about consciousness is primary. Consciousness is creating the, way, the particle to appear. The other thing that I say, and people may get upset about, is this shows that everything is conscious. Because the wave, whatever is going through those slits, knows when there's an observer, knows when there's not an observer. When there's an observer, it becomes a particle. When there's no observer, it becomes a wave. So it knows where, when there's an observer and when there's not an observer, and consciousness is defined as awareness. It's aware of whether there's an observer or not, which means it's all conscious. And people say, that's not what it means, and I say, yeah, I think that is what it means. Everything is conscious. So this is this experiment, and there's been other experiments that have been run that seem to show this, this idea that it, the observer always has to be, when you have physical, you always have to have this observer thing. This is where it starts to go. Um, and you can see this is sort of where the US military may be going with this. Why would the US military be interested? This is a video, comes from 2004, University of Southern Florida. And it's got to do with um, an F-22. If you want to see the actual long video, you Google search F-22 and rat brain. They take 20,000 neurons from a rat brain. We have 100 billion neurons. This is only 20,000 neurons of a rat brain. And you can see where this technology may be going in terms of flying the craft. Some scientists have already been experimenting with such brain dishes. Their chips were less precise, but their results sometimes remarkable. Let me disconnect the light show. Dr. DeMars, for instance, tries to communicate with his brain dishes and teach them several tasks. So each of these dishes contains about 20,000 or so neurons which are firing away as we speak. So each one's an individual network and they'll fire spontaneously. We take living rat neurons and they will rapidly form a neural network and we have this grid of electrodes underneath the surface of these living neurons and we can listen to the conversation among the neurons and we can also stimulate activity within that network we can send in different patterns of stimulation and look at how the network changes as a result of of those stimulations and that's how we do what we do what he does is to teach his brain dishes how to control an airplane the network can essentially fly the aircraft in a pretty optimal way. So it won't overcorrect too much and it'll be able to stabilize it in a wide variety of conditions. I think I've programmed like a 50 knot crosswind into this one. It was what it looks like. And you can see it, the aircraft when it hits one of these crosswinds, how it begins to oscillate. So it comes down to this idea that you can get the pilot if you can wire in like these neurons and the pilot just can do whatever he wants. You can move here, here, shoot the weapons, and it's all done by thought. It's the symbiotic relationship, being one with the craft where you're one. So we go to that, this is the woman, so now we go to the craft. So I'm gonna play you a couple of episodes here. And these are, I'm putting them on my White House, I have White House UFO, all one word, YouTube, and I'm putting these on, you'll see a number of these. I, I po post these interviews I do with these people flying. This is the first woman in 2013 who came to me. She's been flying the craft since the 1950s, and you'll see she talks about this band. Philip Corso uh, in the day after Roswell talks about these bands. She said it started with the bands, and the bands disappeared. Here's her talking about how, to, how she flies the craft. Got older and then was introduced to the ships in my teens, uh, first, the very crude ones, the head pieces were large, cumbersome metal things that fit over. And a couple of years later, they were small, almost not noticeable on your head. And a few years after that, there was nothing. It was to connect directly with the ship. It's, it's, it is. It's a very difficult thing to describe because there's no word that we have for that experience. It's just, so the nearest 
thing I could say is we are functioning as one. Um, it senses and knows, and I sense and know what it what it's experiencing, what it's thinking, what's going to be happening. Some areas, Chip takes over more of the brain work, and in other areas, I do. So there's a trust relationship there. Give up some, it gives up some, and but the unified two is is greater than two separate. The pattern that you'll see is the person comes in, they're told to put their hand on a panel, on a ball, and she said earlier with, with the, the bands, you become one with the craft. They all say the same thing. You become one with the craft. The craft is alive, and whatever you think is what the craft does. So here's the next one. This is Susie Hansen, who has spoken here in Denmark. Uh, here's her talking about flying the craft. I was told that I would be given the opportunity to use two different modes to fly the craft. The first one was manu was manual, and the other mode, of course, was using the mind, using consciousness to connect to the craft. Um, I was assigned an instructor who was one of the male uh, beings on the craft, and uh, so he gave he demonstrated and he gave me some quite a lot of background information about um, the wobble of the small scout craft that some people often report that sometimes described as a falling leaf movement. And uh, I was told why they use have to use a manual lever to operate the craft sometimes in our atmosphere according to atmospheric conditions, certain energy points on the craft, the flow of the magnetic field, etc. cetera. So um, first of all, he demonstrated the the manual by using this uh, lever that flipped up out of the console in front of me. And uh, and I assumed that because I can drive a car, et cetera, that I would find that fairly easy to do. It would be a bit like flying a glider, et cetera, with a, a little tiny joystick. However, I soon found that um, overcompensating on a stick meant that the craft was um, – kind of nearly flipping and uh, moving in, in a way that wasn't good at all. So um, that kind of canned the idea that it was going to be easy to do a manual. Uh, next, I was instructed on how to use the, the connecting to the consciousness of the craft, which I did by placing my hand on a rubbery panel on the console. And uh, I was given the opportunity to practice this. So it was sort of like expressing your intent through consciousness, so not not uh, willing the craft to go forward, but just by instructing the craft quietly. And it was almost as if your consciousness and the amount of effort or intent or strength that you put into the consciousness was equivalent to how much the craft moved. That's really the only way I can describe it. The consciousness was so closely linked to the craft that um, that it was almost like an emotional uh, an emotional aspect to it as well. So you weren't just simply instructing a computer and saying, move the craft forward 15 metres. You were actually moving your consciousness with the whole intelligence and structure and um, organicness of the craft. Most of them will describe it as a dream. And I always say, oh, everybody describes it as a dream. Tell me the story. And then they go through the script. They'll tell you the whole thing. So the next one we have here, this is a guy who had a dream from the time he was um, about two or three till he was 10, and he describes it. And then at the end, you'll see me asking him, have you ever heard my lecture on flying the craft? And he says, no, apparently not. But here's him talking about this dream that he had twice a month from the time he's three years old till he was 10. Yeah. But I would have it several times a month whenever I was an infant. And I would tell my mom about this dream, and it freaked her out. And the dream was this. Um, in, the, in the dream, I'm in space and I'm floating, like I, in my body, I guess. I'm floating in space and there's stars. And down, then down below me over here, I can see this, this silver disc object. And so I, I look at the disc and then I go, and then I'm inside the disc. So now I'm standing in the disc and it's flying through space. Control panel, there's a guy sitting at the control panel, looks to be 45-ish, white hair, short haircut, 
wearing a like a satiny white tunic um, with like a rope belt, um, sandals. You know, so very you know kind of an old outfit, if you will, but just real comfortable flowing. Greek. Greek? Yeah, I mean, I kind of. That's I mean, it wasn't a toga, but it kind of looked like that, you know. It was, um, and the guy sitting at the panel in in this position, um, with his hand on a dome that's on the panel of the craft, and there's a viewing portal or whatever right in front of him here. So as I so now I observe the inside of the ship. I observe the guy, and then the perception shifts again. And now I'm the guy. I'm, him sitting at the control panel. And how, um, what's with the hand thing? What's happening? The <clears throat> hand's controlling the ship. I'm when Did I touch, touch the panel, yeah, you know, okay. the, there was no buttons per okay. se. It was all very smooth and simple looking. But when I touch this dome, then the, the and, and at two or three years old, now you ought to imagine how much this freaked my mother out. At two or three years old, I, was, I understood that when I touched that, it linked the ship to, to my mind. And that, at that, when I did that, the ship felt like it was an extension of me. I could feel the ship as if it was an extension of my body. Have you heard my lecture on, my <laughs> consciousness lecture on flying the ship? Apparently not. <laughs> I had one, I'm trying to get him on film. He came to my lecture in LA. He didn't attend the lecture, but he came to the dinner after. And I was talking about this and somebody said, Robert, you missed Grant's lecture. He talked about flying the craft. Tell him about your, your dream. And then the guy said, well, it was a dream. I said, well, everybody says it's a dream. Tell me the story. And then he said, tell me you're a pilot. And then he said, I said, you're a pilot? And he said, yeah. I said, what have you flown? And he starts naming these planes. And then he says, F-16. And I go, you've flown F-16s? And he said, yeah, I'm a retired U.S. Air Force colonel. He was an Iraqi fighter pilot. And so then I said, well, tell me your dream. And he went through the same thing, the same thing. Become one with the craft, put your hand on this pad. But he was standing there and he said these beings were behind, not beings, but there's figures behind him. Doesn't say, everybody else says the same thing. They don't say they're aliens, they don't say they're humans. They're just figures. They always describe these figures with them. And he's standing there and he's at this panel and they say, go ahead. And he said, I don't know what to do. And then everybody gets the same thing. They say, the person says, you know what to do, just do it. And so here's an F-16 fighter pilot. And he goes and he puts his hands and he said, the thing is alive. It's like lava, lava light. And it's, the thing is moving and he's, he's got his hands on these panel and all of a sudden, oh, he's flying the craft. And he says, it's just like, fly now it's like flying a jet fighter. And he's flying along and then he, he's thinking, that's kind of weird. So he takes his hand up and he's, he's waiting for the thing to stall. And he's looking and he's got his hand on the panel and the thing's still flying and he's flying around. And then he takes his, he's going to take his other hand off but he's afraid the thing's going to suddenly crash or stall. He takes his hand up and he takes it a little bit so he can put it back down again. And he's, and he's still flying the craft, and he's got his hand up, and he's flying the craft. So you get that. And now the last one I want to show you is a 747 United Airlines pilot. And he's also involved in the story I'm going to tell you next is about the Zendras. And the Zendras is how they get here. So here, the next one here is a 747 United Airlines pilot, and he's flown the craft. And he's had numerous, same thing, dream. I said, go ahead. It's a dream. Everything says a dream. Tell me the story. And he basically, you'll hear, he goes through the same items as everybody else. And there was a, another person standing next to me. And I was looking at this gigantic screen and we were going through some clouds. Um, like, um, you know, coming out the other side of the clouds. And, and I was the person who was actually controlling this, this graph. But it was the situation that what I get, it was that the physical touching was more like a, some sort of a connection. It was an entrainment. Uh, it was more of a connection to the, to the brain, to my brain. And it was all mostly controlled by thought, by, um, it was, um, you know, something, uh, later on, they came out with this movie called Firefox with, um, um, yes, where there were, there was some kind of a mental, unlike in the movie where he actually has to think. And, and I'm, I'm sure they did that for the benefit of the movie where he vocalizes. There, there was no vocalization. It, it was just mind and craft. It was 
rather than the craft controlling the person, the person controls the craft, sort of a augmentation or an extension of, of the person's brain functioning. Uh, and, 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 and that's all really what I remember. And I don't know, I have, I have not told anybody else. I have not compared notes with anybody. I don't know how my situation compares with the other guys or anything. This, this is basically in a nutshell, what I experienced. You are, it's an entrainment where where the two of you connect it's a it's a common uh venue or communication means you're i was more like a very perhaps an oversized bowling ball type thing it was it was it it, it wasn't flat it was kind of round but i did not see this i i can tell you by the way it felt in my hands that there was a curvature to it, but I could not see how the size of it, right? And and you know, there is no, um, it's like a total complete surrender. There is no if and buts, you're one. There There is um, a sense of calmness. Uh, there is no sense of any threat. Um, it, it is, it is 100% connection. Okay. So he was also involved, this guy, I phoned for two reasons. He was flown the craft, and he was also involved in, he went into a Zendra with 49 other people. And so I wanted to talk, and this is the last part. This is the second, uh, third message I got from an alien. And as I said, once this happens the third time, you're listening very carefully, to make a long story short, I'm going to Mount Shasta, California last August. For a girl who helps me with the books and stuff is a Latino. She's from Colombia. Uh, wanted me to go sit on a mountain and meditate for world peace. And all these Latino people come to America. They go sit on the side of a mountain and they meditate for world peace. And as I've said, I have nothing against meditation. I have nothing against world peace, but I really am not keen on sitting on a mountain meditating for world peace. But she had helped me out. So I said, okay, Katerina, I'll come to California. It's a 40-hour drive. I'll go there. We'll go sit on a mountain and we'll meditate for world peace. So I went there. I was with another assistant who helps me with the books now, and she was with me in the car. We're going across the Nevada desert. We're going to be stopping in Reno for the night and then make the last part of the trip. And her cell phone rings, and it's a message from an alien. So it's Katerina, the first girl, the Latino girl. She's got a message, and basically the message is coming across through her and through another woman, Aunt Terrell, who's an alien from the planet Apu. Uh, Aunt Terrell knows Grant's coming to the mountain, and he is to let people know. So I said to Desta, who is her cell phone, I said, get the message. What exactly is the message? Let's get it on paper exactly what it is. Because I knew there was, you know, it was going to be pretty ugly when I put it on Facebook that I got a message from an alien. So I wanted to make sure the message was right. So we got it, I put it on, of course people started to attack and it's like, this is crazy stuff. And again, to make a long story short, it was supposed to appear Saturday night. How many people are familiar with CE5, Stephen Greer CE5 stuff? Okay, this is basically a CE5 on steroids. Stephen Greer will have lights, music, or they do all this stuff you know, to attract them in. The way this works is they have these people that are called antennas. Started in 1974 with two brothers who, one of them started to do automatic writing. He's doing this automatic writing and they're in touch with this alien. So they go and say, well, how do we know it's an alien? Like, you know, and they say, prove that you're an alien. So then the message comes across, meet 60 miles out of Lima, Peru, Saturday night, we're gonna fly by. And this is where it starts. Now there's groups around the world that have been trained in this procedure of this automatic writing. And in each single group, they have what's called an antenna. The To The Stars Academy is looking at these experiencers and they've got the same thing. They say there's a brain pattern in every experiencer that is this sort of represents an antenna. Like you're in touch with something. You're able to tune in. So these, these antennas in these Mission Rama groups are able to tell you 
to the minute when, when these, these things are going to fly by. So I, we go to Mount Shasta, and this is the guy that was running it. There's about five of these people around the world. This is Ricardo uh, Gonzalez. Um, and it, you basically have 150, 180 people come there. It's a lot of meditation, people oming, doing all this kind of stuff. And the, the UFO thing is a, like a side thing. It's not, people don't go there to see a UFO. They just go to do the meditation. And then fairly often they have a, a flyby that they'll say it's called a program sighting. The antenna will pick it up. Saturday night, this coming between 9 and 10. So I knew it was between 9 and 10. I go there. This is an overhead view. You can see the people in the big circle. They're all sitting in this circle. They're meditating. And we're up 4,000 feet. It's freezing cold. There's another Rama group across the road. And later on, I actually wrote them after we had our experience. And I said, uh, what happened on your side of the road? We had something happen here. And they sent me this 32-minute video. It was like Star Wars. It was like just all this weird stuff going on on the other side. So they have it. This is a, a, a woman who graduated from Columbia University as a psychologist, um, basically said, keep me out of this thing. You know, I've, I'm working with autistic children and stuff. This is the message she got on the Thursday before. I got the message on the Wednesday. She got the Thursday, the event happened Saturday night, 21.33, so 9.33 at, at night. I didn't know, there was two antennas who had got the 9.33. So I'm sitting there and at 9.33, Suddenly, this flash over, over my head, and I look up, and I'm looking up in this pitch black. Pit, there's, there's no moon, it's just pitch black. I'm looking up in this flash, a flash again, and people are looking up, and they're sh shooting lasers at this thing or whatever, and the psychologist sitting right behind me, and she taps Ricardo, this guy. She said, Ricardo, look at your watch. It was 9.33. I didn't know the 9.33, not until after, and when she showed me the 9.33, let me tell you, I drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, I was in this thing. Once I saw the 9.33, and this thing starts to flash over my head, and it was really weird, because I looked up, and I said, it's right above me. And then I'm thinking, no, it can't be above me. It's got to be above the group. It can't be above me. And then I'm looking and I'm going, yeah, it is right above me. And the people beside me said it looked like it right above me as well. So it flashed about seven or eight times. Most of the time, I thought it was, I was in a lawn chair. I thought I was going to flip the lawn chair. So a lot of times I was looking down and this one huge one went. The people are all cheering. Yeah. And, and so when it came later, I realized like this is very important stuff, that these people have something. They're tapped into something. And it became to me the most important story I'd ever done. Because I'll tell you the next part of the story. So this happens above me. So it's called a program sighting. In 2014, 2015, they, there was a Zendra open there. Now, what a Zendra is, it's an interdimensional bubble that is created. That's the way they describe it, the, the Mission Rama people. They create this interdimensional bubble, and you can go through this thing, like it's a portal. You go through, and you can be in another planet. You can go in. There's an alien in there. And in 2014, they had six antennas who said they're going to open a Zendra. Paula Harris, who's a very, I think she's spoken here, very prominent researcher, was in the 2014 and the 2015 Zendra. And so when this happened to me, oh, here's, okay, this is Katerina. This is the girl who got the message. So here's her telling what happens at 9.33. Well, um, I didn't know about the 9.33. Apparently, Ricardo did. And so, uh, at 9.33, Ricardo, I remember him, I remember you were already looking up, you had already sort of been looking up, we were all looking up, and Ricardo then says, ahí están, or I, is, I thought he said, ahí están, ahí, ahí, and he pointed his laser, or someone pointed their laser, I don't even really remember if it was Ricardo, and we look up, and as I look at the location of where he's pointing, I'm like, Holy shit! That it's it's right above, right, right above ground. And then like where um, we're sitting. I saw it do a little blue. It was a blue, like a spark of, like like we're here. And then and then, and then I was like, people kept looking up, right? And then my neck, like, and and then one of the times I I kept looking up, I see this huge another blue flash, but this blue flash was really big it was like and it was like wow and then people just and after that flash everybody was like yay you know everybody was all excited i think i think uh there were a few a, a few people said i heard some people say that they had seen flashes up to eight seven or eight times 
I think I saw maybe three or four, but I remember the one particular flash that was really big. This is automatic writing from the 1950s. The Canadian government, as I said, he was a contactee, and they were in contact with a woman who actually uh, taught the CIA to channel an alien. Her name was uh, Frances Swan. This is automatic writing from the 1950s. You can see at the bottom of her regular writing, this is all automatic writing, where the hand starts to write, and that was all the communications the Canadians were getting was through this woman who was getting this automatic writing. So it's, this automatic writing thing's been going on for many years. What I found out, once this thing happened to me, and I'm like, I didn't get to see an alien, but I mean, I was pretty impressed with this thing over my head at exactly the time when they said it would happen. And then I started to discover that these 2014, there'd been a Zendra open, 2015, and I started to realize that 1994, that was the United Airlines pilot, that he had been in a Zendra in 1994. There was 50 people went through this thing. Then 2008, 2009, 2014, 15, and in 2009, it was at Uruguay. I think I've even got the video here. This is, this is one of the Zendras. You can see it looks like a, like a fog. And if you look at the Rendlesham Forest thing, they will talk about this yellow fog that appears on the ground before the craft appears on the ground at Rendlesham Forest. So it's this fog thing appears. So here's one. Here's the one at, in Uruguay. This is a video. This thing was there for two days. People were filming it. And 125 people went through this Zendra. They were taking boats out and they were going into this thing for two days. And here's a video of the Zendra. Okay, so when I found out that, that there was these Zendras, I said, I mean, this is amazing. You've got these things where you've got like piles of witnesses who actually are there, they're going in. So the 2014, 2015, I know Paula Harris very well. So I said to Paula, I said, where, where did you go in that Zendra? Where was that alien thing that happened? She said, oh, right over there across the field. And there was a field, there's no trees because it was all sand, and then there's the edge of the forest. So she decides, I, she said, okay, come. And so I go and I got the camera running. And these are all on my YouTube. There's the long versions of these interviews. I go and interview all these people that were involved in this thing. And here they, here's the, 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 um, one of the antennas. One of the antennas of the six that picked up that there was gonna be a Zendra actually said there would be seven people in the Zendra and they've actually got Paula in the Zendra. And this is, was done, I think, a week before the event took place. So they had these, these premonitions. So when this sighting came over, and it's actually on the internet, there's two UFOs come across the screen and they go like this and they head towards the forest, which means end of event, except that the people knew there was a Zendra, that six antennas had said there was going to be a Zendra. So into the forest they go, and they're looking for this fog. It lights up the ground. It, it's pitch dark. It's lighting up the ground. And they find, this, they find the Zendra, and they can see that this Antarell who sent me the message is in the Zendra. They go running back. They go to Paula, and they say, Paula, Antarell's in the forest. Are you ready? And she goes, oh. She starts to get really uptight that she's going. She doesn't really want to go in there. They sort of drag her to the Zendra. So I'm saying to her, show me what happened. So we go out into the thing. I'm going to play you two minutes. On my, on my YouTube White House UFO YouTube channel, it's 22 minutes. She goes through the whole thing, who was standing where, where the alien was. And this guy was one of the guys that found the, that went into the forest. Uh, he's been, he's seen the being about five times. I asked, I said, were you scared like Paul? And he said, no, nah, I've seen him before. And I said, well, how many times have you seen him? I don't know, five times, maybe more. I don't keep track. And so these groups follow these contactees around the world. And I just was in, Fran in England last week and I ran into another woman and they've got photos. So we're gonna, and she's from France, she was in Spain. They had some of these events in Spain. So this guy finds the Zendra, I'm talking to here. Here's Paula, here's about two minutes of her describing the event and what was inside this Zendra. And what happens is the, the fog forms on the ground, this is not in the thing. Almost like Reynolds from Forest, the fog forms, it's whitish blue. At Reynolds from Forest it was yellow, but this white fog forms and, and, and Ricardo says there's a bunch of women are gonna go in. And he said, you hold hands and do not let go until you're through the fog. So they're going through this fog and everybody's sort of freaking out and they go into the fog and Paula said it was the scariest moment of her life when she got through the fog and she was standing there and she had to let go of people's hands. And as soon as she let go, what was described to me is all seven people had separate events as if they were in there by themselves. Paula heard this being talking and she couldn't understand what he was talking about and all the other ones had different events. So here we go. I mean, I, I'm, I can see it again. I can see 
That, that's the tree he was standing next to. Just let me just take a deep breath. So the small tree beside the one that's bent over. Uh, yeah. That little baby tree is where I was standing. He was standing next to that tree. It, see how close I was? Yeah. But you know something? Come come to that spot. Come to that spot. And where was the stuff coming off the ground then? Here. Just in here? The baby tree. What I call the baby tree. Right in here. Right this area. And so you're standing here and he's I on the other side of the log? He's uh, He's standing next to that second skinny tree. See the okay. second skinny okay. tree? Yeah. I can't walk over there. Can yeah. you no. see it? Yeah. It's pretty uh, straight. And he was standing pretty straight. He was standing against it. Because I remember thinking the tree was really straight, but he was straight too. And then I remember, oh, uh, what's her name? Sol is over here with her arms outstretched, walking towards him. So that's how far away I was. I did not move from this tree. <laughs> I did not move from this. I had no, you know, I didn't know what to do. And my, my translator, Karina, was standing right there. So she, she... Well, she was here too. I didn't know that. Karina was standing there. I was holding hands. And then I had to let go with Suyapa and um, Mercedes. Um, and uh, I had to let go, and then you can talk to Mercedes, but she'll tell you she turned around and she, I wasn't there, she says. Wow. And uh, I was here. So <laughs> she said, she turned, this is how close we were. We were standing this little baby tree. We were looking right at him. It was right there, that, that skinny tree. And a year later, Mercedes said that she turned to the side and I wasn't there, but I mean, I can honestly tell you there was no way that I wasn't there. And um, also I could hear him speak from here. I could hear him talk. That was like an echo. He was talking right like I was opposite him, so he was like right there and he was an echo. It was like a bullhorn. Did you see it as an honor to have no. experienced it? No, I, I was confused. I didn't know what the protocol was. I thought, what am I supposed to do? Supposed to say hi, you know, like, what are you supposed to do? So I think I just kept looking at him, trying to understand what he was saying. He had a hoodie on, he had a dark outfit, he was 10 foot tall, so he was like, he was like, just picture 10 foot above, he was tall, he was very tall. And so um, at the, I'm listening, and at the very end, he says, thank you, like a robot, turns around and walks right back into the forest. And um, so I didn't know what to do. I thought I was hearing things. I thought I was going crazy. And these two women did not hear him talk. Wow. So what do you do? You know, I'm not crazy. I heard him, but I couldn't understand what he said. The only part I understood was a thank you. Uh -huh. uh, at the very end, sounded like a robot. These are the people. So when she told me that, you have... 14 and 15, both times they have like nine or 10 witnesses. And they're all describing a 10 foot tall being who looks like he's a, uh, a swimmer. He's all muscular. He's wearing a bicycle suit very tight. He has a, a thing on his chest, like a, a sort of a, a thing on his chest that's shooting off sparks. Everybody's describing the same thing. White hair, people very clearly describing this thing. And I'm thinking like, wow, I mean, this is like unbelievable. You've got like 10 witnesses who are inside one of these things who are actually describing a being and that these things are happening over and over again around the world. So she said, well, these most of them are here. And I said, really? Let's go interview them. So this is the group that all these people have been in the Zendra. And this is before I came, because when I came, they just... They're all scattered. Nobody wanted to be on camera. And not so much because they didn't want to tell the story, but because their English wasn't very good. So they all scatter. And I got most of these people, and on my White House UFO YouTube channel, you'll see interviews with these people. It's the same thing. What did you see? And they go, oh, it was this being. He was standing there. He was like 10 feet tall. He looked like he was a very muscular. He's wearing this bicycle suit. And they would all describe the same thing. And then in 2015, they have a second, second event. And in that one, and they'll wrap it up with this, the second one, it was the same thing. Most of the witnesses were the same as the first ones, went into this Zendra, and they had little tiny beings, and usually they'll describe big beings and small beings, and the small beings had what were like iPads, these little iPads, and they're holding these iPads, and they believed this was the engineers who were 
making the Zendra, for, keeping the Zendra open, opening this interdimensional portal. And they're standing there, and they're peeking out, they're smiling, and they're peeking out from behind trees and stuff. And that year, uh, the, the Antarel appeared again, and there was one particular person who, we didn't put the interview on the internet because he, didn't, he was a big military guy in the United States. He didn't want to go on the record, uh, but one of the people who was outside the Zendra, when they were coming out, he was interviewing everybody as they came out and describing, what did you see, what did you see? And they were all describing the same beings inside the Zendra. And he said to me um, that this guy came out, and this is the first experience he'd ever had in his life. And he came out and he said, Tom, it's for real. There are aliens out there. I saw them. They were in there. Tom, it was unreal. And Tom described, he said, it looked like the kid's first Christmas. He was lit up. He was like, wow. And then, and then at the end, he would tell him the whole story. And then he said, the guy looked like he just talked to God. He was so overwhelmed. And this guy, I talked to him later. He, I, I, he didn't want to go be interviewed. Uh, because apparently he sort of freaked out a little bit while this was going on and didn't really want that to be made public. So I, I got him to agree to an interview off the record, and he said, okay, 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, I need two hours. I went, two hours? And he went through great detail about the fact that once he had this event, and he never had a UFO event before, once that event happened, he would have all sorts of stuff, almost like any other experiencer. When he went home, the, the car is in the, dry, is, is, is in the, in the, uh, the beside the house, and the, the windshield wipers are going, and the water's shooting up, and their car isn't even turned on. And the, the only way they could stop it is to let the, the battery drain. This thing, they couldn't shut it off. Bizarre events, he'd go to a birthday party and this 10-foot alien is standing in, in the room of the birthday party and he's looking around and nobody else sees this alien, this bizarre world. So to me it was the best one because they have these events all around the world and it's not one person. This is like 10 people and there are films. As I said, when I was in France, when I was in, in, at Gary Hesseltine's conference, this woman came up and she said, oh, I was just at Ricardo's event in, in Spain. And I said, oh, and she said, Ricardo says hello. And I said, okay, good. And then, of course, I went to her and I said, did anything happen when you were there? She said, oh, yeah. She starts telling me all these stories about what happened. And then as I'm going on to lecture, she says, oh, we got these uh, films. And she shows the first one. It's like a blob, a bluish blob. The second one is sort of like three bluish blobs. And the third one, there's these aliens standing there. And, it, and they're not, it's the old deal. It's, they're not, you can't see them very clear. It's like they're sparkly. And these three beings, I'm going, Whoa, I couldn't believe it. And these are the kind of stories. So I said, I'm putting a book together on these events. And they're all around the world. And it's, uh, as I said, it's much more dramatic than CE5s, where these people, and they're using consciousness. They have these, these people, and they know this consciousness angle that you can tap in. And these antennas tap in. They're interacting mentally with these beings, and they can actually, at sometimes, actually get these beings to, to, to appear. So I'll leave it at that, and if anybody's got any questions about this, we'll go from there. Thanks, Pia. Okay. <laughs>